I bet if you turned up, you have any lights in your in your room there, Jeremy? You can turn on. Yeah, they're on. This no, is like <laughs> you haven't seen this joint, but like I got a stand up bar. This oh, this wow. this movie could be this house could be in a, a Dirty Harry movie in the side. It was built in the south. Why? Why you have a stand up bar in a room? It's hey man, bad. don't don't question it. That bar serves a purpose, and yeah. at times we've all needed it. It's a classic. But you know, book. if it's not going to work for you, man, you should actually go back further into the shadows and just go full Colonel Kurtz. Just okay. like yeah, oh, right? yeah, like just if it, if you can't make it work with the light, dude, just go the other direction, right? I oh. I usually have it set up in the other room so I can watch TV and do stuff, but then I'm the the sunlight comes in from behind for. Mm -hmm. All right. Face is all dark out. I like that small talk crime poster in the back there. Yeah, baby. From what I understand, that's the uh, the best movie made since Platoon. <laughs> I've heard that's the best movie. That's on the you know uh, everyone's top five of all time. Are we ready to do this? Your brother just walked off the show and said, "Fuck this." His <laughs> silent protest. <laughs> All right, so who actually came up with the gauntlet? Whose pick was that? Was that yours, Ian, or that was, was it yours, Ratchford? That was mine, because, uh, again, it was... I, I just remembered the whole gauntlet scene, like the bus. And, yeah. and as I said, this whole kind of <laughs> thing started during COVID when I started watching movies with my 10-year-old that I was seeing when I was between 10 and 15. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, because I went and saw the gauntlet at the theater. Uh, Did you? I must have. I must huh. have. I, that would have been 77. I was 12 years old, and I don't know what the restricted whatever, but we were going to the movies all the time. There were, I think, six theaters in my town, three major ones. Do you uh, think, do you think that we should work, we should wait for our fourth guest to come back before we get into this? Hit in the head or something, but, um, it's it, both of those movies are pretty. Both those movies are pretty seminal for us as well. The, yeah. the whole Clint Eastwood collection is really a uh, a massive a massive part of our childhood. Like our mom, right. our mom got the Clint Eastwood collection uh, when we were when we were in our in our adolescence. And every two weeks, I think a new Clint Eastwood uh, video cassette would come in the mail. And we unravel it and just watch it to death. And it was everything from Firefox, Iger sanction. I mean, it was like it was a lot of his B pictures as well, as well as the, like the Leone, you know, Sergio Leone trilogy and the, uh, every, all the Dirty Harry movies. And man, we watched them over and over and over and over again. We just loved them. We couldn't get enough yeah. of them. As I was saying that this kind of started off during COVID, I started watching movies with Revma, who was 10. And it was amazing stuff that he took from Eastwood because uh, he got the 45 Magnum monologue down before I knew it. And then the other one was in one of the Leone films, which like, uh, uh, you uh, you made my mule upset. Or, yeah, you made my... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's start this. You guys ready? Everyone got their lighting set? The Vaseline's good? Everyone's... I, think we'll good. I think it's as much as it's going to get. All right. And it's pronounced Nelms, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. All right, everyone. Time for another episode of Combat Radio. Recently, we've been matching wits with some of the industry's best who've suggested a film, sometimes not a very good one. And we've tried to match it with something equally as bad or entertaining, or in this case, something good. Once upon a time, I was at a screening at CAA, and I sat next to someone I thought was an extra from the movie Convoy, directed by Sam Peckinpah, but it turned out to be Jeremy Ratchford, who's with us today below. He's one of Clint Eastwood's favorite actors from Unforgiven. Jersey Boy's a regular on Cold Case. And he did us a favor this week because he brought in two excellent filmmakers who may be the best young filmmaking team working today, Esham and E.M. Nelms, who are killing it with all things film related. And these guys suggested a couple of movies. So we're going to match wits with the classics that you know and love, or in some cases, hate from Clint Eastwood. The first movie up, The Gauntlet, which I suspect actually was probably a dirty, hairy pitch. But anyway, um, I think who now who 
put their hand up and said gauntlet gauntlet was that you jeremy okay. or you said that okay. but so as i said started during covid watching these movies so i went back and it was in the opening of this movie that i i i had this epiphany because uh uh the car comes oh, first callahan because i mean his name is shockley i think yeah uh, it's, it's not callahan yeah but he's yeah. he's callahan yeah this is where i figured out that to 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 know what clint's characters are about you got to rely on other actors and props because mm -hmm. he does the same thing um so in this one he leaves a bar it's early in the morning the car drives through phoenix up to the courthouse and when the door opens a mickey of bourbon crashes to the curb and that's when you're you go oh um this man has a drinking problem <laughs> is that how you saw it because i thought that was the first casualty and i actually i, I was kind of <laughs> sad by that i thought we were going to be watching a very sad movie when that started well and he's supposed to be you know like she's like oh shockley you're a bum and he was he's always nipping that little bottle but he doesn't change like there's Here. there's there's no slur. There's no slop. It's just the same. It's the same. Well, go, oh, we're being told he's drunk. And then I'm telling him that he's stupid. And, and that was the other thing about it. So it, very early on. So this movie, and it was like kind of guiding my son through it too, because we went from this one to Midnight Run, which mm. is the exact same movie. But Midnight Run... 10 times that get to A to B and B to A. Yeah. Right? But I I started watching it that way. And I like, can't And it's it's a theme in, in uh Eastwood movies too. He's always talking to the guy who's fucking him over. Like every it's like the police chief. I'm gonna come in this way. Uh, we gotta do this. And yeah, yeah there isn't too much mystery to it, but before we go down that rabbit hole of let and, and get in Midnight Run, by the way, is a pretty fun movie. Um, but let's get the opinion of our intrepid guests here. All right. So you guys, uh, Ian, I believe it was you saying that your mom had like a Eastwood ritual at the house where the video cassettes would roll in and everyone mm -hmm. would, you know, gather around and watch the latest Eastwood movie. Yeah, I'm not sure where I'm not sure. It must have been some kind of Warner Brothers special, or I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but uh, we had the Clint Eastwood collection coming in every two weeks. We'd get a new a new disc or a new sorry, it was a new cassette back then. Uh, disc. And uh, man, we watched the hell out of those. Um, yeah, the Clint Eastwood collection. Um, and I we we've talked about it when we were doing our our press tour for for Small Town Crime. We talked about how Eastwood and and the Dirty Harry films were a huge influence on that movie, um, and and on us. I mean, there's just. I don't know. There's there's uh, there's something about that character, right? That he's he kind of wanders into these situations. He's it's not that he's it's not that he's reluctant, uh, but it's just like he doesn't give a shit as he's going through these things. Um, I mean, I will say like the gauntlet, like the gauntlet as Shockley, he's not as competent as Callahan. Yeah, he's, he's kind of a a you know blundering his way through it. Obviously. Uh, was it Sandra Locke, right? Yeah, yeah. She's now hold on. I just before we get started. Were he it was Eastwood and Sandra Locke ever an item? Do I not know? I should know this. Yeah, yeah they were. They were together for 14 years. In fact, she said he destroyed her career. I got some Warner Brothers litigation notes I can bring into this later, but it bore you. Yeah, they were an item. Wow. There's there's like genuine moments. <laughs> Like where you could see that they're actually like they they are a couple, and obviously like they did like five movies together or something, right? Yeah, yeah, six yeah. I think. Yeah, so many, and like there's that moment in the bus where she like puts her head on him and she like plays with his ear a little bit, and you're like, oh man, like that's a that's a hundred percent a couple. Like that movie, that moment feels so freaking authentic. Uh, I don't like I don't know. I was I was like, oh yeah, they're a couple, you know. Um, so yeah, I, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, I was just going to set the stage for the audience who hasn't seen this. This is a a mission where used cop gets an assignment from a DA. It's outside his department. So there's a little mystery and intrigue out of the gate where uh, he's got to sober up or stay sober up long enough to get a witness on a plane for whatever is going down outside the story. Right. Am I, is that pretty yeah. much it? If I remember it right. That's yeah. it. Yeah. 
but it does give us everything you want in movies like this. It has the hooker with the heart of gold. It has Clint Eastwood in what I think is like his sixth or seventh Dirty Harry role, not named Dirty Harry, but he's that he's a sort of a carbon copy of that character, which is very lovable. But uh, then I think this movie starts where there's like a horse racing like quote on whether or not they'll make it right isn't that yeah, yeah. Am I... 50 to one which gets up to 100 to one right oh right the odds on whether they'll make it yeah and then at the end she puts five grand on them they're gonna do it because they're gonna move to the country and have have a house with kids and dogs right many... in the okay. <laughs> no no go for it well i'm just curious it's like eastwood so like we're also watching essentially a dirty harry movie that eastwood directed yeah. Right, so how many uh, is was this the first one of those series that he directed or he because it's 77 i didn't look at imdb um and apologies oh, like you and i come at these from fans like we i never really geeked out and like went down the imdb rabbit hole no, that's okay movies. like i don't know these these actors i just watched these movies like 15 times between the ages of 15 and 22 and then now i hadn't watched them for like 10 years and i was like man i gotta get in there and watch this again <laughs> It was good for me to see it too. I mean, it was like kind of like a retrospective, you know, and, and, and like I totally had misremembered parts of it. And just to see the town and the police gear and the approach and just the nonsense, like you were saying, Ratchford, to let me get on this rotary phone to my boss and tell him exactly where I'm at. And yeah, then him not. <laughs> so there, there is the movie we could talk, you know, the helicopter stunt or whatever the hell, but to mm. me, what it came down to. Is that you've got the entire uh, 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 Phoenix department lined up? They're going to be if they don't hit the bus, they're going to hit each other. They're going to hit each other, and they're <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah. And they, there seems to be hundreds of them. Yeah, and they shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. They go down two city blocks with just nothing but a barrage. Yeah. And it's only at the end that the tires blow. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, yeah, I mean, there's so my, so my other favorite part, though. He gets out, and the cops kind of go, "Hey, wait a second, something's something doesn't smell right from the department." So they put their guns down, and that guy goes, yeah, 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 yeah. "All of a sudden, he shoots the DA." Yeah, shoots Eastwood. She gets the gun, shoots him. Oh. Like there's 200 cops in like a 10 foot, like they're they're like two feet away and not one flinches. Not one look, oh, gunfire, like, oh, oh, they all just stand there. Yeah. I think that's, oh, a, that's a pretty big difference. Like between this, the gauntlet and Magnum Force, the logic yeah. and the execution in, in like the set pieces is is much, much better in Magnum Force. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. like you, you have to forgive a lot when you watch the gauntlet, you know, like you're like, oh, wow. Okay. Like the, be definitely the best vehicle to be fleeing a helicopter that's trying to shoot you is on a motorcycle in the middle of the desert. Like that's definitely what you want to do, yep. you know, but you and just kind of go for it. When that breaks down, the train's driving slow enough that you can get off it. <laughs> yeah, but only, know. only Shockley has got the guts to, first of all, I love that they pick up Eastwood's favorite resident redneck. Who's like. Oh. Having a tab cola and lunch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it too. That's, <laughs> that's, that's arguably like one of the best scenes. Like with that gentleman, that's like one of the better sequences. That guy was killer in that role. Like when yeah. he's asking her to describe her work to him, and he's kind of like into it, but like I don't know, man. There's so many things happening with that guy and his character. It's so good. And then he loses it when she says, "Does your wife know you masturbate?" That's yeah, I'm like, I honestly thought she was going to accuse him of something far more harsh than that, and I think it may have been, but like they tempered it back for the possibly, possibly. The other, the other one that got me is that in the opening too, when he's buying his first Mickey at the where they find out where the odds are. Yeah, that waitress that's talking to him about airplanes and pilots, and I yeah. goes, "You're going to be in the air, and the next second you're going to be on the ground." With a, a dachshund uh, 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 nibbling on your appendix or nibbling on your pancreas. And I was like, what the fuck is this? It was not you know, I could sense that there's moments where um, actors genuinely wish Clint Eastwood would give them another take at it. 
and you can, <laughs> you can cut like that's one of those scenes where you could feel like maybe the waitress overplayed it and maybe would have liked to have done it again and eastwood said fuck no it's in focus we're moving forward because he basically it's it's not. <laughs> and look i mean we hear that that's how he directs now but i wonder if, it, if he was doing it that way then too you know yeah I know. but let, I, I want to talk about something like the squib work in this movie is insane yeah like this might have a record for the most squibs ever used in a film. Just well, on the sequence alone. The and, house, the bus. And were these, and were these squibs? Were these squibs or did they just shoot the shit out of that house? That's That was a question I had too, because you could never get away with that now, right? Especially in like a post-rust environment. But like, yeah, they got away with wild stuff. And even like some of the stunts with that helicopter, like so close to those power lines and stuff. I'm like, wow, you could never fly that now. Like this wouldn't even allow you to do it. That was actually my other uh when they I love because that whole sequence. It's like we gotta get out of here. It's like uh three streets down, second house on the right, it's my house. I know it's always convenient. And then <laughs> they come in and he's like, I called in the boys, they shoot the shit out of it, and he still doesn't think yeah are involved. And she's got the trap door that gets them like what a hundred yards away? <laughs> yeah well you know these these hookers in their spare time they got to build their escape hatches and it works well there's also that what would be that staple a team moment later where he welds together kind of like a like a battle tank type it's cockpit he gets, he gets the yeah. he does yeah. like the, the like the the rage dozer before it was the before it was a thing right like oh uh, it's incredible see i don't even know if i could turn a welding torch on but Shockley, he's obviously got his degree and he's he lets it rip. And uh and she's got like a little section too where she can crouch down, right? And yeah, and then they have to he gets shot oh. in the leg. And then halfway down the ride, he goes, Here, drive. I, I don't know why she's driving. <laughs> yeah. so hey, you gotta get her in on it, you know. I think he puts a tourniquet on his leg, but uh yeah, yeah, it just goes it's like here. Let's take this moment at this little time. All right, let's let's go around real quick. Ian, we'll start with you. Favorite scene in this movie. What's the scene that makes this for you? It's easily for me the guy, the redneck guy in the in the sheriff's vehicle driving. That whole sequence with him and with him and them and her reaction to him and his reaction to her is so fantastic. Yeah. I, I'd say probably the most the craziest thing about that scene is that Eastwood is playing third fiddle the whole time. And he doesn't feel like he's playing third fiddle, but he's so good at the wincing and the, and the smiling and the, like those subtleties that he adds to a scene, he's playing third fiddle, but he, but, but it's, it's easily the best, best scene in the film for me. All right. Um, Jeremy, I'll go your way. I, I just got to say that whole ending uh, with like six shots going off with people within four feet of each other. And not one <laughs> reacts. It's, I just loved it. But uh, yeah, Asham, what do you got? I I honestly liked when he he just walked up on those bikers and kind of just went ham on them. And it's like I don't know. I thought that was scene was actually played like pretty great, you know? Because yeah. how else would they, I do think the bikers were really understanding? They're like, you know what, this guy is nuts. We should just ship out. But yeah. um, and I liked when they, they were walking that. away. The guy's like, "What are you gonna do?" <laughs> what are you gonna do? And you can totally see how that scene was blocked. It's like, hey, we're only gonna pay one person to talk, so that's gonna be you, and you're gonna get all the lines, you and this guy, and then we're gonna see you later in the train. I don't know. I, it, it worked for me, man. I thought it went. I don't know. Oh, that's great. And I, I have, I'm gonna piggyback off of that too, because when they do meet up with them in the tr the rail car, yeah, the way Sandra like, hey, you, oh, what are you thinking? <laughs> like, what? That's what. Hey, we're gonna stop beating up the cop, and and it was the I hate the, this is gonna sound really weird, but that was the longest rape scene. Like they they well, seemed to just, to I rape, don't know right? what they were doing for the five minutes. <laughs> yeah. It was very romantic. <laughs> and you know, Eastwood put Sandra Locke through a few of those scenes because he would direct sudden impact, and it had that theme throughout. Yeah, where she yeah. just gets brutalized. Oh, he's um, smacked her like three or four times. Oh, dude. Right? Like right in the beginning. Smacks, he just got so the old school smacks where he smacks her constantly trying to calm her down. And oh, <laughs> so dude, amazing. You know what it kind of reminds me? Like what I realized like watching this, I'm like, oh, this is a black comedy. 
Like I, I hate like Eastwood knows exactly what he's making. He's kind of winking at the camera. It's so over the top. He's like, this is this is a satire. This is not a, a dirty Harry movie. I'm doing a satire, kind of a send up of it. Well, it is because hmm. too, they're they're, they're they're little that little like they're fighting and fighting and fighting and also it's like, did you mean it about that house? And yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And they're falling in like you want kids yeah there's that whole line and then, of course and then at the end too don't you die don't you die <laughs> yeah i just it gets weird right like i wonder if he had had an outside director because i did feel like as much as i wanted those nag 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 lines to work like they were in odd spots sure yeah. running to the train nag 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 yeah there's like, one of the very like weird skinny. spots is it to his old partner? I think at one point he goes nag nag at the very beginning. So if I remember right, both these movies actually have the same editor, Ferris Webster. Hmm. But it seems like there was less for him to work with in Gauntlet than in Magnum Force in terms sure. of fine tuning it. You know what? Um, that so ten minute fucking motorcycle helicopter scene was was enough i mean that thing dragged on and it's like they're just driving and driving we think they're gonna do something in that tunnel and then all of a sudden he's like fuck it we need to keep driving that's like the exactly. half exactly. <laughs> that sequence is so good like the the, the, the helicopter stuff working there where they're like splitting canyons and like doing all kinds of, um, honestly there's one point where they're riding towards you on the motorcycle and i'm like and the, the copter comes up behind him and kind of swoops over like behind him yeah. I'm telling you that rotor blade looked like it was like three feet from their heads. Yeah. Like, that was freaking crazy. Like that they would do that. So when we were at Warner brothers, man, there was a guy there across the street who ran that Italian restaurant. He was a Vietnam era helicopter pilot. Wow. Um, and his name's Alan Donovan. And he since sold the restaurant to, I don't know who, but we would talk like helicopter movies, like blue thunder with them. And the th like the opening of the thing and, you know, it's like he reminded me that a helicopter does not need like a plane to shoot over you and circle back. He can set it on top of you. And that's what I was thinking with this police chase going. He keeps like making passes at him when he could literally just come right up behind him and hover over him and create like a dust storm that makes riding a bike near impossible. But I mean, this, this is where people like who are fans of the movie tell me to shut the fuck up. Yeah. You can't because I'm yeah, taking all I'm, I'm taking all the air out of it. But well, it's certainly it's certainly you he should have hit it. He sh they, they should have been shot on that fucking bike. And then I guess the question, probably the craziest question is you look like you're like, what does that look like on the script? In the mm -hmm. script, right? It says, Okay, he's getting chased by this helicopter. Okay, great. We got a helicopter chase sequence, we'll put that together. And it's like, and then as he's riding, the helicopter gets caught in the power lines. And you're like, well, that was fucking fortunate. Like, what was mm -hmm. his plan otherwise? You know, he's just going to keep riding through the desert until, pray to God, they were going to, you know, something was going to happen. Because he has no, he has no offense. He has no, there's no plan to take that thing out. It's really just happenstance that they, they crash into those power lines. Because it's not like, or at least the way that it's cut, right? It's not like they're saying... Yeah. He's like, I'm going to get over into this canyon where there's these power lines, and we're going to try to see if we can get him caught in those power lines. Oh, thank God it worked. You know, yeah. like, he's kind of fucking driving and locks out those power lines. And to your point, like, you've seen that scene, like, a million times in, like, a aviation yeah. dog fights and stuff, where they're, like, going through the canyons and stuff. But it's, like, a bit of a different dynamic when you're doing motorcycle versus helicopter, and then, obviously, they're so outmatched, and that must be, in both movies, they have, like, oh, they have, they, in that movie specifically, they may have the worst hired sniper team on the planet because number one, <laughs> they're trying they cannot hit the broadside of a barn from that helicopter. Okay, you know, I get it. But then later when he gets his, they get his buddy to set the trap, and there's like a hundred feet between the bus and the squad car that he's putting him in, and like sniper's like sitting there, and you're like, okay, well, any any time now, like take the shot. They're out in the open, and like, nope, they go like a hundred feet to his car and back. Well, I love how Eastwood looks so annoyed in that phone booth where he's being shot at, and he's kind of like, <laughs> "What is it now? Like, what? Like, who?" He's like, "This fucking like he does." He's not even surprised by the chopper or panicked. He just looks up and he's like, "Oh, before I've had my coffee." <laughs> how did that helicopter find him there? Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of convenience to both these movies, but primarily to the Gauntlet, I think that you have to sort of overlook.
But um, also, um, I guess, you know, there's not much civilian reaction in these situations. Yeah. Except with the bus, like these hot, these choppers, like there's no concern for anything really too much civilian related, which kind of like, especially at the end where I'm like, God, that looks really deserted. You think all the people are over in the coffee shop being like, that's a hell of a racket up there. They got going those cops. You know, like nobody's like, what the fuck do you think's happening up there on sixth street? It's Vietnam. <laughs> all right, you just, you just touched on another one from me and it's um, uh, again, our favorite cop that they get close to the border and she's like, but what if I'm right? And they are going to get us. He mm. gets out to get out of the car. He drives and he goes, how you doing, fellas? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Get out of them, and no one checks the car. No, they, never they got him and her. See, I have a theory there that they knew it was the redneck cop, and they were just content with that at the moment. <laughs> they were like, "Finally, we could go back to the boss and say it was an accident. We got rid of this guy." That was but, the funniest part too. And like, uh, wasn't there a scene where they're trying to explain? Like, he's like, he calls his boss again, and he's like, "They fucking they killed that fucking guy or whatever," and they're like there's something about it to where they just really underplay how many bullets are in it. And like, yeah. it's like, it's not like, I mean, it's not I, like, I'm telling you right yeah. now, I'm convinced this is a satire. That this is a comedy, a dark comedy. Eastwood know exactly what he's doing. Mm. And he's like, of course the cops are utterly incompetent on every level. You know, the heels like straight away. Like the second they're introduced, you're like, Oh, the DA is corrupt. And his Boss, yeah like, absolutely corrupt like you just it, the second you see them there's not a doubt and there's the pat hinkle character that can't figure it out like still mystifies it like as like a sort of an audience tool like assistant di assistant district attorney hancock you know we got him he's coming right here and he's like no no i'm glad you told in fact come back to my office quite don't say anything come back here tell me what you know <laughs> you know, it's like it's like they can't really i love that the Sunderlock to hooker with the heart of gold is like doesn't it make any sense to you that they knew exactly where we were at my cat house and then at the chop and then he's like what are you saying yeah. <laughs> like, well, like if you think about the iq of every lead or the ensemble like she's by far leading everyone by 50 to 100 points yeah as most like, hookers do they're usually the smartest person in the room well, yeah, if you save five thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> in that time. Uh, so uh I want to get everyone's favorite character, favorite character moment here in a second, but I do love Clint Eastwood's line where he's walking away from the jail cell. He belts her and he walks away and he said, Well, like they scale her from like a one to ten, and he says she's a two, and that's only because he hasn't seen a one. <laughs> Dude, uh, are you kidding me? She like if you're looking aesthetically at her, like she's, she's like out. a nine or a ten. Like what yeah. you, I don't know. Okay. Dude, it's so ridiculous. All right. So everyone's favorite character act and slash actor performance in this is what? As you, you can kick it off. I think like honestly for me, it's it's a I, I'm gonna go with Sandra. I just yeah. think she's so good in the I honestly think she's really good in the movie. Jeremy? I'm going with my waitress. With the, the, the dachshund. <laughs> yes. The dachshund. Cause, and I had to go, did she say dachshund? Do like it was, it, it's even a strange name for a dog. <laughs> no, it's not like, you know, like a German shepherd nibbling on my pancreas. It's like a dachshund. Yeah. That's my Ian, name. who do you got? Uh, besides Eastwood, I just love watching that guy wince and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, wince his way through a movie man he's got such great looks um he cracks me up i found myself laughing out loud you know to esham's uh theory of it being a dark comedy in a way um the darkest of dark comedies um yeah man it's it's it, i really liked the uh besides eastwood i really liked the police commissioner the corrupt police commissioner there's mm -hmm. that great line where he says uh I'm fucking i think it's when he pulls over and stops at the payphone with the with the redneck uh sex the guy talking all the sexy talk with the hooker and he uh he stops over there and he, he has a phone call with him and he goes all right well okay we'll we'll do that we'll 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 have him trade you we'll have him trade you for it in phoenix or whatever at the line and he's like okay great and he's all 
Now, can you handle that? Or do you need me to write it in Braille and shove it up your ass? And then he just <laughs> yeah. up yeah. on him. And Eastwood's like, uh, what do I say to that? He winces and he's like, uh, okay. And he fucking hangs up. Yeah. Just, for no reason, that guy's just being such a cocksucker on the other end. So oh, do you God. wonder, that sounds like a line that would have been written for Eastwood, but do you wonder if like yeah. maybe he just ad-libbed that and, you know, we don't want the expense of another take, so let him say it. I mean, it is so appropriate in that moment, but you're right. Eastwood's reaction is kind of like, what just happened? What was just, what did he just say to me? Yeah, I. it's it's possible. It seems yeah. like something that Eastwood would have said to that police commissioner because he mm. hates that fucking guy. He knows he sent him out there on a death run now. Or I guess maybe he doesn't know that, but he he knows he's out on a tough run because he does say on that phone call, isn't he like, you're a two-bit, you're two-bit, uh, witness in your two bit case, uh, people are trying to fucking kill us right and left. So I'm going to take her to the county line or whatever. Yeah, because it, it makes sense that he followed that up with, "Can you handle that, or do you need me to write it in braille and bring up your ass?" Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> in Dirty Harry, he's got the line where he's like, he's like put on suspension and he gives up his bat. You know, they they auction off days. It goes from sixty to ninety to like one hundred twenty, and he hands over his badge when he's he hands over his badge on command and says, "Look, there's a five star suppository for you." <laughs> you know, so he's 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 made these kind of sort of innuendos before. But you know, my favorite I think character in this whole movie has got to be, and this is just the cynic in me. But after the gauntlet is run and the bus comes crashing to a halt, and they get out and they stumble out, and either right after the DA gets shot or taken hostage, or before, there's one cop who steps in front of another cop. And like lowers his gun. Yeah, uh, I do remember that. After there's like the Tet offensive of police work, one guy's got it in his head, like, right, maybe not, maybe not this much violence. Maybe we stop here. Well, it, <laughs> yeah. he looks like the, the sergeant or whatever, like he's leading them all, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I don't think he's bleeding. That. It's Clint's bleeding leg that comes off the bus. Right. <laughs> and he comes off the bus. He's got the gun in his belt, so he still could be a threat to their they're saying he was. He hands yeah. back to Sandra, and that, that's when they go, put your guns down, boy. I know. Yeah. This but, is what our own. <laughs> I just wonder, too, if, if Clint, and look, let's go on the other, other <laughs> side of that, right? Like, maybe Clint doesn't see the logic flaws in that when he's shooting it. And, and like, I wonder if, is that because he's in front of the lens, right? Because if you watch that scene any any other way, like you just said, Ratchford, you're like, okay, he comes out with a gun shoved down his pants. Like, they're going to unload so, on him. Right. Yeah. Like what you do is you throw the gun in, you take your war- your paper out, and you hold that up, and you lead the way with that, right? But you know what, S, I, I'm with you now. I <laughs> this movie's got a whole twist now that I it is it's it's got to be a send up because and again I go back to that ending with six shots going off six feet from each other with two hundred cops surrounding you and no one fucking blinks. It's like Smokey and the Bandit. It's like he's doing Smokey and the Bandit. I'm yeah. telling you right now. Like, you look yeah. at it, and, like, the way the house is just obliterated with bullets, yeah. the way every car is shot to hell, the way those cops are all lined up shooting literally at each other. Yeah. And the way he kind of walks out after the house shooting, just, like, he just walks out, like Burt Reynolds would have in a Smokey and the Bandit, just kind of walks out seeing, like, hey, try to live normal, you know, or whatever he says to yeah. her. Like, he's, he, like, oh, he's, yeah. <laughs> like, he's the dumbass. We're gonna walk across the desert. Look normal. Yeah. <laughs> He's dirty as fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's. I don't know, man. I like laughing a lot, and like, there's those little looks that he gives her, like when he first picks her up. Isn't there a moment where he's like exiting her her cell, and she says something to him, and it's like he's like, he like kind of takes yeah. a minute, and like yeah. walks out. Didn't this have like a Frank Fazetta like m- cover poster, like kind of like inspired by like the old Conan the Barbarian kind of it's artwork? Like drawing, you're saying. Yeah, with like Clint yeah. with and like Sandra like hanging off his leg like the native woman in the Conan movie and like like well, they're all that riddled. So much sense, right? It's like family vacation, the, the Dirty Harry movie. Yeah, <laughs> seemed like it, right? The one, I forget. The, one I, the one I saw was the Redux for the box, the Dirty Harry box set for the five movie box set, where it's uh, it's like it, it's a really cool artistic drawing, black and white with a little bit of red. Of nice, him leaning out. You know, it's, it's yeah. great. Hold on. How's this for a segue? So now uh, we got Magnum Force and it's the gun. So, and the thing, it's, it's got the, the 
uh, the cello going and bland. They're, they're kind of cool jazz music. But you could just see that, and it looks like a still, and then you kind of see a little little waver, and you go, mm -hmm. that's Clint holding a gun for yeah. the whole opening credits. And then at the end, oh, sorry, sorry, then at the end, the gun turns to you, or first he takes the safety off, and it turns to the camera. This is a 57 Magnum. Yeah. And that's the start of that movie. So yeah. great. That, honestly, I, I'd forgotten about that beginning, and I loved it. It oh. set a tone so quickly. I was like, oh, I can't wait for this ride. Yeah, it, we're was, gonna it was a badass James Bond opening, like, yeah. like Clint Eastwood style. Like, okay, here we go. Ooh. And you get all the credits in the front of the movie. Smart. I don't know, with the red background, and you're just looking at that hand cannon, you're like, yep, this is going to be was, It was bold. Great. You yeah. know, it's not Clint's hand, though. That's the funny thing. I mean, uh, that they, wouldn't be right. He's not going to sit there for that. Right. That's why I thought. But they said his hand was too small. Like, he was willing to do it, but it looked too small, I guess, holding the gun. I've, By the way, I fired a few. You guys probably have, too. It almost took my arm off. I've like, it's the most... <laughs> I've fired a 357 before, and that almost took my arm off. It was a boom, big jump. But Yeah, yeah it's before. it's really inappropriate in the field for that kind of reason. It's just too, too much to handle. Uh, but... So Magnum Force, obviously written by my old boss, John Milius, and supposedly directed by Ted Post. There's a rumor going around and has been going around for decades that Buddy Van Horn, Clint Eastwood's longtime stunt captain, who was actually his brother in the original High Plains Drifter script, but turned out to be the previous marshal. That's Buddy Van Horn playing that role. Some people say he and Eastwood directed it. Milius does think Ted Post actually directed most of the movie. And I have to say that at least part of that feels right, because when you compare it to the gauntlet, which is later, the gauntlet feels a little bit clunky in the edit sometimes to me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but Magnum Force, which was 70, what, four, three? Uh, three, 73. 73. Super tight when I was watching it. Yeah. That, there, yeah. For me, and look, there's definitely a different directing perspective on Magnum Force than, than the gauntlet. Yeah. And I and I you know, I would be hard to press to believe that the same person did both those movies. Yeah. Me too. They were I mean they were different directors. Is that what you're saying, Ash? Yeah, but he's saying there's a theory that that Eastwood had a hand in in his stunt director, wow. stunt coordinator in the in. Magnum. Yeah, there's been talk of it for a long time, and maybe they obviously they ran. It was a Mal Paso production, so obviously he ran it, but. I feel like Ted Post probably gets sort of sniped from the credit on it because it feels like or much more. The movie feels pretty tight. And honestly, this is the best cast of any of the Dirty Harry movies, I think. It's done really freaking well, man. I honestly like yeah. I remember liking this one a lot 15 years ago, and I was like, oh, yeah, this movie's strong. Like, now, I'm just curious, like the screenplay. So it has Chimino on it as well. Yeah. So how much of that is, I, I, and I just read that book, uh, Chimino, which was pretty darn good. And they talk about this, but it's 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 five books ago already, so I can't really remember a lot. But how much of that draft is Chimino? So I, I can only give you a theory on that. But one of the things that I would base my theory on is I can really recognize Milius in almost any script, even if you like blunt, told me it's not even a script that he's associated with. Do you think Milius wrote any of it? And so I look at this and I think Chimino is probably the guy that put more of like the um, like conspiratorial ties together. It feels like to me, um, the guys, you know, it's funny because Milius said that they were sued during production by somebody who claimed to have invented the death squad. And it was like a real lawsuit. And that was the claim. And that he, Eastwood was sued all the time because people wanted to get him into court. Yeah. Eastwood at this time, was doing blood work on the lot. So he was there. This is the time I told you, Jeremy, that he told you, he said to you, he was going to have to kill you. And he told me when he, when I met Eastwood that he had to leave to go kill a few people. Like it's, <laughs> it's part of like his conversational, you know, motif, but uh, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know. It never really came up because I actually felt that it feels to me like 90% of this is Milius, but that can't be the case with both writers credited. But definitely Milius is the airport sequence, no doubt. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, that's, great, Mili that's such a great sequence. Really yeah. And, and I think, I can think I honestly, <laughs> what's that, Ian? I'm sorry? When he says, can I make a suggestion? Oh, my yeah. gosh. And you know it's coming. 
and it doesn't even matter. Like you're just like Love it. you're pumping your fist in the air, like, yeah. laughing. You know, like there he is in his pilot suit, like going straight up to the plane. You're just like, yep, it's all there. We yeah. have to cut all together every time Eastwood was had a meal interrupted, where he's still <laughs> chewing when he wants to get to the bottom of it because he's doing it in that scene too. He's still got like the burger in his mouth, and he's like, "Hey, yeah. I got a couple of ideas here. Well, why don't you guys give me a captain's hat, and how about a suitcase full of maps and shit?" And I'll go out there and pretend to fly this fucking thing. And what and is an I'll overseas him. pilot? Is yeah. it speciality an overseas pilot? You know yeah. what, though? Overseas pilot. Wait, you know. Here's it where you got to appreciate the theory that no part is too small because those other dudes in the cockpit that are looking at him, yes. they're like, they're like um, excuse me, Captain, this might sound like an asshole question, but have you ever flown before? Yeah, <laughs> and they 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 did a great job with him. Like, sorry, just to go back, but like with the eating part, like just tying that thematically through the movie, right? Where he's like, nothing dissuades him from shoving food in his mouth until he figures out what's happening. And he's not. Yeah. So he lost his appetite instantly. You know, like and I, I love was like, oh, what draft did they figure that out? You know, like oh, we well, like here we should have him stop eating. Yeah. Well, and he you... doesn't. The other thing too, when he's looking, it, it, it it's full of. The classic Eastwood, he's looking through the, the microscope and he just goes. <laughs> no, you don't need any more. That's it. That's it. My other favorite one is when he yeah. gets to his apartment and Sonny comes out and goes, hi. It's yeah, so hilarious. Are you the cop that lives upstairs? Yeah, he goes, what do I got to do to sleep with you? Oh, and my he, gosh. You just see him and he, he goes, he blinks three times. He goes, like, did you just really? And then he smiles and goes. Knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't remember, but I feel like there's so many. Like it's like a staple in those movies. It's like masculine wish fulfillment, right? We're like, he's always able to just crack a cold one and relax. Yep. He can eat whatever he wants. Burgers yeah. doesn't yep. matter. He doesn't gain a pound. Women are just throwing themselves at him right and left. And he's like, well, and the scene, the scene right <laughs> before it too. His ex partner's wife. Yeah. It's on him. Like it just, yeah. I, I love it because like this guy is just like, oh yeah, baby. And Which like, I actually like, thought it was a priest. A that was in the bed. Yeah. What did you say, Ian? What did you say about that? I thought that that was one of my favorite scenes in the movie when uh I thought there was so much going on there with her character. She did such a great job with that scene where the kids and stuff upstairs, and she's like she had so many layers going on with that character. She's trying to get laid, she's it's fucked up because it's her husband's buddy. And then their buddies, you know, like she's she's fucked up about her husband's uh, mental trauma. Like it's all I thought she was doing great because, you know, Ratch, I know you got kids. I got kids. Uh, a lot of times you don't get a lot of personal time. So her being a single mother was you could just see that she's just getting run to death. Yeah. And the one and time I, I, comes I, loved, over. I loved her line of too, like, how come you never made a pass at? Which is such a like a a, a, a tender. It's not, because it's not lascivious then. Yeah, the ass is sort of like a. Mm, it's almost cute. So yeah, it's almost, it's, it sets him up to be such a great guy, Harry. Yeah, you, you, but they're always he's always kissing her on the lips. Yeah, there is a lot of lip kissing, and I'm like, yeah. well, that's interesting. I don't go and kiss my buddy's wives on the lips. And it's but like, does he do it at the beginning, or it's only when she when she, she to him, and then when he's leaving. That was like the truly what you said. He is like, she's like, I just need something that feels like I'm getting something tonight other than my kids terrifying. You know, it's like, yeah, she's, she's desperate for him. Yeah. You know, uh, Esham, you were asking about what like Chimino's contributions were. That's a really good question. And I don't have any answer, but, you know, Chimino, he was like more of like a. He would, I, I guess he would go through and write like, like, I, I don't I don't want to I don't know I, I have to read the book again I can't remember what they said his contributions are and I don't want to say anything that's wrong they do uh, cover it though they cover they cover that they talked about they? It and, you know yeah they talked about some of his contributions I, I want to say he did some of the sort of like hyper masculine sort of stereotypical locker room chat stuff mm. that's kind of what I remember them saying um I think Milius would have that on lockdown for sure well, okay, then the scene, like the scene at the cost plus, with the the uh, they're at the stakeout. Oh, like, brother, you 
You got to yeah. backtrack on that because he gets a call to go to that. Yeah. Like Correct. that's our, that's, that's already wife. in progress. No, no, but I love it. They call his partner's wife's yeah. house and she goes, oh, it's for you. Which, okay. Yeah, that was yeah. crazy. <laughs> and he says, I'll be right there. He goes in the back and then we're into the hole. Stuck it. Stuck it. Like yeah. it was like, oh, oh man. That scene was intense. Th there's always this like, homoeroticism like throughout it right and he's like yeah. little pockets right where he's like asking him to blow a shotgun there's like the whole part where they're talking about the the um motorcycle cops being couples or gay you know like oh. it's when eastwood says uh if if, if 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 they could shoot like that i wouldn't care if the whole oh. department was queer and the guy at the door they hold on him he's like he's all standing there what <laughs> what you yeah. say queer like yeah. hey, no it Oh, it's fuck. interesting, right? And it's like Eastwood is like this enlightened man, like going through like the the, the Neanderthal period of of our of, of masculinity. It's really interesting, man. Like I, that's right. Like there's so many layers in the in that movie compared to the Gauntlet, which is very straightforward. It's just like, think here you go. All right. So by now, I think the audience watching this knows to go back and check the movie out. But if you want to know the setup of this, right? These are all San Francisco's worst. Who are not convicted in the courts are getting waxed by what ultimately turns out to be a death squad of motorcycle cops one or several right um and dar robinson also did most of those motorcycle stunts clint eastwood actually i think tried to claim that he did it but it's clearly robinson on the bike for him for dirty harry mm. it, clear to me anyway There's but maybe that's just an asshole comment from me there's definitely parts where you can see that it's clint on the bike but, I mean, yeah, for uh, some of it. Yeah, and but they, um, they strapped him on that hood and stuff too. I was like, wow, like was wasn't that great? Yeah, yeah. I love were, when he they cut back and forth between him holding on to the lip of the um uh, of the hood and then him on the front of it not holding on to the lip of the of the lip <laughs> of the hood. Which I was like, that's an interesting mistake because you'd like it makes sense that he's holding on to the lip of the hood. It does not make sense that he's not holding on to the lip of the hood. <laughs> You'd think that they would be able to keep that continuity. I love this cast, though. I think every single actor from Mitchell Ryan to Robert Urich, those guys were all perfect yeah. for this. There wasn't one person I thought that kind of, even his partner early is great. Yep. Um, who's and he's great. What's that? Hallberg's great. Oh, man. He's defended. That guy is just such great. a perfect police captain type. You know, and when he's especially when he's like, you're going to work with Briggs on this. And if you fuck up again, I'm going to stomp you lower than whale shit. And he's like, well, speaking yeah, of whale like shit, yeah. what have you turned up, Briggs? <laughs> 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 and he's just like, Even what's that? The, the, so, um, the black prostitute in the back of the car. Yeah. Yeah. Like the little like when she's like tucking the money away and then she does the little like leg peekaboo Ooh. thing. Like, I'm like, wow, that was like, I don't know, man. It just every, you're right. Like everybody in this is really freaking good. No, From that's the one. That's, I, I, I concur. I was going to say, she's in it for a minute, but yeah. she's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. She's phenomenal. And is that Margaret I, Avery that plays that part? And I'm not, I'm doing, I'm sorry. I don't know. But then we got to the most fabulous pimp mobile. Oh man. Ever. Yeah. Like that thing was just so gorgeous with the fuzzy dice the furry dash like all that and then that whole oh and that's also the this is where this these sequences start to come in that i really loved the the way they use the rear view mirror and that that cop that the, the motorcycle you know the camera mounted on the motorcycle. Item, then it's in the mirror then yeah. it moves it's like they're building so much because they does that whole chases the pimp down and the other one that I loved was when they went to Suzanne Summers' house and you see the motorcycle come up, a long, windy thing, and, it, and there's a bush. You're on the top of a hill. The bike comes up, all in one take. The cop walks up and re-enters frame with the bag and the gun. Yeah. I was like, it was this slow build. Like nowadays, it would have been cut, 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 like, get there, get there. But this was like, do, 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 do. yeah, it's refreshing, isn't it? But here's my question: like, I'm I I wasn't present in the vigilante planning meeting, but like, if I didn't put my hand up and say, well, 
why the guy, uh, guys in the pool? Like, I get the mob guys. Like, you could sell me on that if I had a vigilante mindset, and you can sell me on some of this. But I'm like, why the pool party? I well, think why the smoke when, they, when they go through the toe, the toe tags, like I would assume like they're either in like some of those racketeering things or something, right? Mm. Yeah, the toe oh, tag could explain it. I'm sorry, so then the other one, the other one, the, 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 the naked couple on the bed doing cope with the the the, oh, yeah. the other guy. I don't touch that stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it was like what were those two doing? And his partner from the enforcer is on the stakeout that, that becomes his partner in the next movie but he can't like for some reason this stakeout is like i guess for observation purposes right across but there's no one to radio down like they have to go down all those floors like they don't see it and report it they have to see it and act so he doesn't they don't even get to the scene before and doesn't is that that's where mitchell ryan gets killed right he gets blown away yeah. because he's yeah and it's kind of weird they don't explain why charlie's there He's just kind of like pulls in after the accident. Because he doesn't seem yeah. to be there in any kind of heightened uh, circumstance, right? He's not like, hey, you know, we got a, we got a killing. Someone fell off the building. What the fuck happened? Da, da, da. He's just kind of like, hey, there's a fellow officer. Bam, you know? Yeah, it's weird. And like that, and then you, I would assume Charlie's in on it with the other four. But and, I don't think so. He but, must not be. Is he? I don't, I mean. I actually, it feels like it was random. You, they just because huh. Charlie was there, they just shot. Him. Like, why wouldn't you just be like, "Hey, someone just shot this guy and ran out the door." He had to like off poor Charlie. So you're yeah. thinking with like 2024 film logic processors, <laughs> know. you know that makes a lot of sense in this conversation. But I'm wondering, like, now you got me thinking, like, was he in on it or was it just one of those things where they needed him killed so he was written into the moment? Well, am I crazy or do they show Charlie actually doing some of the assassinations? No, but, you never, you never but, really know. Yeah. Which cop is doing it? I, there, there was the, the the one when he talks to the pimp. That's the most dialogue, and I think that might have been the Kip guy because I didn't recognize is David it? Soul's voice. It was only David Soul in that apartment that you kind of go, "Oh, that's him," because everyone else was glasses like it, helmets. And that was, was a, so hard. It's a great so character. Hard. I'm sorry. The character, uh, the opening. Where he's watching it on the TV, and the helmet's there, That's and there was a picture of his dad as a cop. It was oh, interesting. And that whole leather gear getup of the like, you go, okay, this is a micro cop, leaves yeah. the house, but you never. I. It's almost like, I think Terminator took a page from this because all of a sudden that aviators the helmet Jack, it it's so stealth. It's like Darth Vader in a way. Like they're just, wow, it was a great character introduction to four characters yeah. yeah and to your point like it's shocking how hard it is to delineate who's who when they're wearing that get up because you still have oh, so yeah. much of their face left and i could have sworn that charlie was like i could have sworn charlie killed the um ricka that got off yeah in the beginning okay. I thought that was him that killed him maybe well, now i'm gonna have to watch this again which won't be a problem because it's a fun movie but <clears throat> What here's a question for all of you. How long actually is a coon's age? Because that's how long it's been since he's seen Harry. Remember that when he says I haven't seen you since a coon's age? And I was what I was like, what fraction of time is that? Yeah, we gotta Google that. I don't know what exactly uh, what Coons is, Age? I heard the term. Anyway. Uh but I love that guy, Mitchell Ryan, and he would come back, of course, as the main villain or one of the main villains opposite my boy Busey. Um and Lethal weapon. More Busey stories later. We don't need them today. Just make everyone nuts. <laughs> but uh, Ryan certainly to everyone's so good. I mean, I love when they're betting on the partner's lifespan too, and they're asking him if he even wants to get in on the bet of how long oh, he yeah, will survive. Yeah. And oh god, the the dialogue is so good in this movie. And you know, anything related to the weapons, I would think was definitely. I agree with you, Ian. It's definitely Milius, especially in the target practice sequence. You know, and the whole ballistics thing and big Briggs, uh, you know, asking for the bullet or yeah, the whole mystery around the bullet. And this is evidence, right? This is what he believes to be evidence, but he hasn't entered it as evidence. So he can kind of keep possession of it, I guess, for the time being. But so good, man. Those guys are so good. And Tim, uh, Tim uh, Matheson also. Yeah. The four guys 
like we were saying off air when we were waiting for you, Ian, like I'm surprised no one's tried to remake this and, and I'm sure Eastwood's the reason why, but from like the assassin's angle. Sure. You know, because aren't you kind of curious, like what happens at the Academy? Is it like Hal Holbrook who shows up at like an Academy dinner and like, like, like spouts his sort of like philosophies on how to handle crime and then kind of meets with them socially for, you know, like taps with George C. Scott, you know, when he gets all his officers around, you know, remember that movie taps before they yeah. seize the military yeah. Academy, George C. Scott kind of implies this like conversation and a conversation about duty and stuff that you should cross the line when you see fit based on, you know, your training and whatnot. So like, is there like a meeting with Hal Holbrook at some police Academy? Like I got a job for the four of you. Do you think that I'd already seen it? So I already knew the twist. I'm trying to remember back when I first watched it, if I knew those four young guys were dirty off the top. I felt like you were, you were definitely suspecting them because they were profiled so hard in the front. Um, I remember watch. I remember my, I remember, my, I remember watching it and thinking that they probably had something to do with it. But the the part that draws that that tricked me when I initially first watched it was when Sweet gets killed. And he gets shotgun down at the door. Yeah, that was, a great, that was a great idea to throw you off the scent of like, oh yeah, of course it's them, you know. And then he gets yeah. shotgun down, and you're like, oh maybe, it could, why would they kill one of their own? It couldn't be him. It couldn't be. And I, well, and also they're they're really trying hard to frame it up that it's only Charlie. Sure. Yeah. Running around the range, like honestly, I like watching it again this time. I'm like, oh, okay, he's definitely doing like the the pool shooting. He assassinates uh, Ricka. Like I thought that was him, one hundred percent. Seems hmm. like he main recruit. I mean, the way that Briggs is talking to everybody, where he goes to Callahan and he's like, you know, we tried to recruit you, bring you in on this, but obviously, you know, you're going to be an extinct, you're extinct now, or whatever. You know, we're going to kill you now. Sure. Um, it the Charlie was, seems like since he's such a loose cannon that he would have been the first person prospect, right? I mean, outside the rookies. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It makes sense. And now maybe he did do the pool shooting at Suzanne Summers' house. I thought, and by, his, I thought his character introduction was uh, that was the only one him backing out of his car spot. Hot Nova, hot but, yellow yeah, Nova. it was just it was like they, he, no one back. <laughs> <laughs> and then he stopped and go, oh hey, hey Harry. But I just realized a coon's age, it says a wild raccoon lives two to three years, but it has become known as a, a very long time. Okay. okay. All right. I'm sorry. That's the one thing I grasped out of that scene was trying to figure out what kind of timeline we were talking about there. But I mean, I love Mitchell Ryan in the movie overall, and I think like uh, even it's so funny to see a, a you know a young Robert Urich, and then I started thinking about all the stuff Urich did later, SWAT, Spencer for Hire, and now he's gone. Yeah. You know, and David Soul, we just lost him. No, oh, did too. He? But they were really well cast. Those guys were. That's pre Hutch, right? Yeah, Magna yeah. Force is pre Hutch. It's funny what you guys are saying too, because I, I, I found with them too, it was a little bit of Columbo, in that you never see the biker cops, but mm. then when their introduction is in the 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 rifle range, and all of a sudden it's like, oh well, yeah, we got four guys, and they're all fantastic shots and they're all what special forces that are now rookies mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's like when they go they don't have the experience well if they were special forces like and they can shoot that way and then uh yeah it's just and, and the next time you see them coming out it was that thing of like we're spending way too much time on these guys for it not to be them sure so yeah we're like oh, but we know we gotta know it's them now we're just waiting for clint to figure it out but then there are, you know, so they try and throw you off the scent a bit. Yeah, both really? these movies, oh, I think. But I love the way, the way Clint gets it to. It's like, here, can I use your gun? And I'm going to lose the contest because I know I'm going to shoot into that wood and come back and get like, it's like, oh, man, that was beautiful. Dude, yeah. That, that contest scene is so, that scene and the, I don't know why, who, whatever genius decides to go rob a, uh, what is it like a, a plate? You know, like, it's, plus? Like, yeah, well, it's like a dollar store, dude. They go to rob, but 
that scene also like when his partner's playing the 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 clerk and he's like right there right the guy's spitting all this racism at him he ends up getting to go, go shoot the guy there's this satisfaction and then right at the end you see him like have a little bit of like holy smokes that was like like there's like remorse man there's like so many great nuanced layers happening just in that one scene with that with his partner and then the other thing i want to say is that kid that gets tossed into those baskets off the oh, top, hilarious. yeah yeah how awesome was that they just hurled that kid like 15 feet i mean that stunt kid he rocked it dude i was yeah, like yeah, he I, did i was just imagining like my 11 year old or my 10 year old boy being able to do that i was like could he do that could he be tossed into baskets like that just take it well, and and the guy that Clint shoots at the end of that sequence too, somehow manages to like fall into it. Was, it's a very comfortable, like it wasn't, you know, having to crash down on him. He kind of like fell back into a fuzzy display of something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I even well, thought the way they blocked that, where like the guy that they're like, that's a suspicious guy with a magazine rack, and then he goes out, and you're like, oh, uh, see, maybe they were wrong. And then three guys get out of the car and come back in, and like, oh, and he's the driver. I don't know, man. Honestly, I thought that sequence was really well done. It was. That was oh, a damn. As you pointed out too, to rob a place that has one cash register. Right, and they're selling like, like glassware. I don't know how much money you're going to get out of there, dude. Like, well, what was funny to me was that they had... last night. There's four of us, so that's uh, sixty of each, I guess. Uh, they had robbed it before, right? Is that why the stakeout? Everybody was robbing that place, apparently. It was a yeah, hot... Like, I don't know what they had going on there, man. The hottest uh, cutlery in town or something. <laughs> I get, I love that he gets there, right? He, they call him at his buddy's wife's house. And he shows up. And he's... They know to call him. They know something is brewing. And it's so convenient, but so right in terms of, like, your emotions as an audience member. And he's sitting there and he's like, oh, there's some salty-looking dudes. <laughs> and, you're th- <laughs> and you're thinking... I wonder who's going to get waxed here. I wonder how this is going to end. But um, then he he takes them apart. And the one cop is like, I've never, I've never shot anyone before. And he's like, just the look of disgust on Clint's face. He's like, why don't you help the lady, huh? <laughs> I thought you, I, I literally was like right in the line. I'm like, well, you still have it. Because the guy comes out and goes, freeze, and just gets shot and goes down, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I would say like the little crime stopping vignettes that he gets pulled into along the way and solving the master okay, case yeah. are probably better than the master case for me. Yeah. 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 You know, like the plane, the cutlery, like the the China store, or whatever that thing is, like the plate store. Like those little vignettes are so fat like great. They're so fabulous. What's would you what's the movie where uh, it's a Chinese restaurant and all of a sudden he's sitting at the table. And everyone's three feet shorter than him, and they're Chinese, and he's there. And the guy's like, hey, "We gotta do this." We gotta. He's like, no, "You're not." I gotta like he's, again. It's one of those. He just. I was walking down the street, and there's. Yeah. A guy, I was walking down the street. And it's like I'm gonna do this. It's he's hysterical. Yeah, well, in the Enforcer, there's a lot of that. It's done really well too. Like when those guys are, they have like a hostage situation, and he goes to talk to him again. I think they interrupt his lunch or something, and he's like, "What do you want?" He's like, I want a car such as, and he's like, so he walks back to the police picket line. And he's like, what are you doing? He jumps in the driver's seat. He's like, they asked for a car. And he drives it right through the building. Yeah. yeah. But prior to that, yeah, what's that? No, 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 lethal, no. Like lethal weapon has those moments too. Yeah. Right? Where it's just like, yeah. oh, hey, there's a, ha- there's a crime that happens to be going on over here. Like, let's solve it. You know, like that's, that's what works so well about these. Yeah. It is kind of convenient how these things go down. Right when they're like, uh, they like there's a famous one in uh, Lethal Weapon Three, I think, where they're they they do the same thing. They go to lunch and there's like a robbery of some nondescript place, you know. But that's the one also where they go to a movie set and they don't realize it's a movie set they're storming onto. Like they don't have yeah. the. But Lethal Weapon One is gold, man. I think that's one of the better cop movies out there. Want to jump? You want to jump? Let's yeah. jump. Okay, so so just thinking about this. And, and why I, I I feel like the little vignettes might be more fulfilling to me than the story, the master story arc, is because you already know the master story arc pretty early on. Like, yeah. you're waiting for Clint to catch up to what you already know. And when you get dropped into those little vignettes, you have no idea what's going to happen, who's at play, like... What's yeah, happening? Yeah. Like, that's the only thing I wish that they had done a little bit better job 
of not showing me that those young biker cops were were the guys like straight away and that way i would have still like been wanting to find out who was doing this right like i wish they had framed up charlie a little harder to be like the fall guy and i've actually believed it totally i did love the scene where he gets back to his apartment oh and it's a great setup he sees uh sunny in the street she's like yeah. i'll go get us a beer and don't worry i've got your key so i'll ch- i'll get your mail <laughs> Like, why do you have yeah. my key? Why does he have his mail key? I don't know. Yeah. But then uh when he drives into the, the to the basement and the three guys are left, and again it's that the dark the whole outfit, the black and white, and it's like, hey, it's kind of hard to prosecute a cop. And it's like, whoa, and it's a great little because he doesn't get too much into like, yeah, it's just like you underestimated me. It's like, holy fuck, man, these are and that's and he does in, in the beginning, checks the mail slot at the very beginning of the movie, check no mail. So this one check what check oh. nobody's that, sending nobody's sending dirty Harry any Christmas cards though. No. It's, it's an empty mailbox every time except for you, your utility bill. But where did that scene take place? Was that in his parking garage where those guys yeah, confronted him? A bit, yeah. So there's one scene in a movie that Ian and I have written into one of our movies that hasn't been made yet. And it's that scene in the parking garage. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it plays on a it plays on a TV at the beginning of one of our movies. Uh and it's you know, it's a pretty big piece of the theme of the film. Uh it's the one we're actually hoping to shoot next. So um it's pretty funny that you picked this movie because I'm sitting there watching that scene just giggling uh with glee. It's it's a great scene. It's a great scene. Well, make sure you invite me down when you shoot it so I can see it it all come together. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, can, like that part. I'm sorry, Joey, but like that part where he's on the range, and he intentionally shoots the cop and loses the contest to send Brilliant. the message. Ah, I'm, it's so good. Like the little tit for tat he has with the rookies. Like he goes through and he goes, "Oh, let, let me see your six shooter." Just like headshots every target. <laughs> until I know, just to prove a point. One. Yeah, just to prove a point, dude. It's like you. There's a, like I'm always a moment where you're like doubting Callahan, like when he. uh like you're, you know, and then it takes you back to where he's like he does the quick draw right and he shoots the targets and he ties the guy and they go to that shoot off and you're like was he planning to do that the whole freaking time well, he missed three shots on that and, fucking and you saw him earlier in the range and he put all of them in the pickle barrel there's not yeah. a single shot he missed so he's yeah. like puts three of them out and you're like okay like he's shooting down to get them to tie him i don't yeah. know it's just interesting how elaborate that could be stacked up to think about. Isn't it funny to think too how this movie could have worked out with the original casting? It going from like Sinatra, getting to Sinatra actually, going through Brando's hands, where Brando and Irving Kirshner were going to do it. Wow! And it was going to be some weird ass Harry? trip. What's that? That's the original Dirty Harry. Could have. Yeah, out. I mean, wow. yeah, it was going to be. It was almost at one point. I mean, it was offered to everyone. Um, the, so this is what I heard in Building 81 at Warner Brothers, which if there was one place for a young kid to work, that was the building because Clint Eastwood had the first floor. Christopher Nolan, the Warshawskis, Wolfgang Peterson, Joel Schumacher, and Milius, and I had the top floor. Jesus. So there a lot of stories. In fact, that's where I got like the production notes on Lost Boys that said that they were trying to cast Keanu Reeves at one point. Wow. Um, so there was a lot of stories in there, but I remember – Talking about this, because this was the movie that I saw as a kid. This is the first Dirty Harry I saw, and it remains my favorite. Uh, but Millius had said something about it. Actually, was at one point, they tried to get McQueen to do it. Hmm. And, and they also tried to get McQueen for Apocalypse. Hmm. Um, but it went from McQueen to so-and-so and so-and-so. And Sinatra ultimately was going to do it at one point. And before that, it was going to be Brando, but Brando was Brando about it. And that makes it all kind of challenging. And Irvin Kirshner did confirm that with me in an Indian restaurant in Studio City that he was going to direct it with Marlon Brando once when we were talking over lunch. But um, at one point, too, they said that it was Newman that was offered it. And Newman suggested Eastwood. Wow. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it felt true the way it was kind of it came up in the conversation that Newman was like, I don't really want to do this dirty hairy thing and but i think probably because it was so physical and i think newman probably didn't want to do all that 
But uh, he's so some people credit Newman with making the Eastwood suggestion, but I think Eastwood was so automatic all along. He's so perfect for it. Perfect. He's coming off of those westerns, like he's just the guy and the swagger for it, undeniably. Yeah, he, yeah, it's a different character, but it's kind of not right. It's the urban version of his western character. Right. Now, what do you take about some of the like criticism that this is like a fascist sort of film franchise? I don't put much stock into that, but they say that a lot about these movies. Hold on. What's fascism again? Refresh my memory. Well, there you go. See, I don't know that I could tell you, but they say it. Like, I I, th I don't think so. I think these movies are pretty entertaining. Before I, I talk about what it is. Yeah, All right, I, so I'm completely blank on that. I What? What uh, am I just not? We're all, okay. We're all, we're all, we're all, I mean, so look, an, authorita an authoritarian or nationalistic rights wing system of social organization. Well, so you're saying that he goes out and just executes without any sort of just cause, and it's just sort of his, you know, dictum of who he thinks. I would right say now. this movie is his direct uh, antithesis of that. It, it's his. It's his attempt to debunk that because he. These are people. The other side Right? Two people yeah. that are more fascist than him, and he's saying, "Well, hey, I, I, I am gonna." I got one scene with Briggs in the car, right? He says, "Hey, I don't like the system either, Briggs, but like until something comes along that's better, like we got to use this, you know, like this is what's available." So, Dude, I think that's absolutely it, right? He's unwinding Dirty Harry a little bit. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, right? you know, he, he, yeah. Through this whole movie, he's he's becoming yeah. more like because. He does, and what's what's I think is fascinating is like he doesn't even use a mag. It's called Magnum Force. He doesn't have a gun through the whole end of the movie. Yeah, he take yeah. away his Magnum, and he has to do it without the Magnum. Now I think it it's a little unbelievable it at times. Like, of that. Yeah, it's, I think it does suffer at, at moments because of that. Like especially like at the very end when like the last guy goes off the boat in the water and he gets on his head, and I'm like, well, what do he do? Like can cuss himself on the bike or something i have no idea how that happened you know yeah, like yeah that was a bit weak david soul just flying yeah. four feet through the air and no that the impact on that water didn't kill him but you it was beautiful it, the the editing sequence of his helmet falling off and then swirling on the top of the roof you're like oh wow and then during that the 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 scene too i love clint sliding us You've unholstered your gun. <laughs> so, for me, what's interesting, right? Does does Clint know all along? Because at the end of it, I was like, oh, what a bullshit ending. He doesn't shoot him and he just sort of drives off in the car and he blows up. And I remember thinking that a long time ago and then I watched it again. I remember like, oh man, the ending of this movie just isn't quite the home run I'd hoped for. Number one, in the in the in the scene where he falls off the 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 carrier and he gets knocked out by the water, and then it goes and it kind of compounds when the is, is the police chief or whatever it is says i'm going to prosecute you i'm going to beat you with your own system and he drives off and blows up but i'm like man there's no way he just wouldn't put a bullet in him right there but then i refresh back i'm like well that guy says he's never put a bullet in anyone. Yeah. so there's no version of him ever shooting clint and clint probably knew that and he was like probably okay, why this guy ever kills me which is exactly why that line's in the front of the movie yeah it's I'm the only way that works right because otherwise you'd be calling bullshit on that moment you're like well he would shoot him there's just no reason you know yeah, I I also thought the karate chops to the neck of the second police officer that he killed was a little weak. We we were talking about this on the last one about uh, how uh, have you ever seen a karate chop work? There was a time in cinema where we it was karate chops and quicksand were taking people out. Right, <laughs> right. Well, we we were talking. I think that was our Airport seventy seven show, another classic, right? Was it where they convenient? They always did that in movies in this time period where they'd knock you out for the appropriate amount of time with the appropriate amount of ease. And I've only knocked a guy out one time, and I felt so bad about it. I drove him to the ER. <laughs> so it's like it's 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 no no one's ever jarred about knocking someone out in these movies. But I guess I'm with you. I don't really love the karate chop to the neck either, but. I when think they were no karate. Like he's a fist, he's a fist meat and potatoes kind of guy. Yeah. It, it, and it's so well, weird, fist right? to the neck would have been more believable, but go ahead. To death, grabbed a pipe and brought it down on him. And you're like, okay, he's done. That's mm. it. He had yeah. to. I was going to shoot him. You know, you wouldn't have thought anything less of him. Oh, sorry. Now going to cross Sandra Locke in uh, uh, the ambulance. First, 
she shoots two shots through the back window that right. hit the 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 the, 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 window window of the car and goes up. Then she gets into like she gets into a fight with Clint in the ambulance, and it's like it's a struggle. Like how is that a struggle? <laughs> What about the fact that does was anyone else thinking? What about the poor ambulance driver? Because he's like, go ahead and get the car ready, and it oh, blows yeah. him up. And there's no mention of him. Terrible, absolutely. And there's no there's no mention of Clint's partner. Yeah, he was blown up by a mailbox in Magnum Force. By uh, the way, that's the connection, wanted. Ratchford, because that actor was also in Towering Inferno. He's the firefighter that goes up. Remember. Oh, wow. partner. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, shit. Yeah, that's the connection. Oh, I love, that. I love All that. right. We just clued it. Yeah. He's great, though, as Clint's partner. They always oh, cast so these good. things well. I'm sorry. I talked over somebody. What was somebody was. He's, say, he's so good. He, he's yeah. Fantastic. And I love that they're all watching this shooting range thing. Like, there's nothing else to do on a Sunday afternoon. I'm going to watch my partner shoot a bunch of cardboard. <laughs> They're all there, right? Even Briggs is there. It's a whole department. Uh, it's a big deal. Is it, it, I guess so. Yeah, I guess it is a big deal. Kind of a fixture now, I guess. And there must be shell cases everywhere. I'm surprised they're not slipping on them like marbles. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So best about best moment of the movie. That should, we'll start with you. Oh man, uh, there's so many great ones, but I think I, I know these ones. For me, I've got to go with the, uh, the the porcelain shop, you know, hold up. You know, I, I just, that's, that sequence just really works for me, you know, to the film throwing the kid to, I don't know how his partner was already there and undercover behind the counter. I can't explain that one. Either. I think it's just you, you get the idea that they're staking that place out and that that guy is, he stepped in to. Because well, the, the captain keeps saying, you're on a stakeout. You're not on homicide anymore. You're on a stakeout. Like, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All right, Ratchford, you? Uh, I, I think you're going to say when the prostitute goes down, gets blown out the window and goes, no, I'm kidding. That's a close second, man, because that that body fall was almost exactly. like uh, uh, the same one in Towering Inferno when yeah. the lock bounces. Like, when, they, the when they discovered the bodies bounce off a building because you just go, oh! oh yeah, oh. totally. Totally. And you know who that actress was that that character played that character in? That's no. Jennifer Jones. She was married to Norton Simon. Okay. Wow. So she had done she'd been nominated for Oscars and everything. And for them to just kind of kill her off like that in Inferno was a pretty pretty sharp move, I think. But anyway, get back to the the action uh, yeah. at hand. What uh, I've got to say, I think the whole airplane sequence because that's what i remember oh yeah cool kind of funny because after talking with you guys here it is those those vignettes that's like the it, it was the go ahead make my day moment where it's like somehow a retired cop has a a, a burger joint there and says oh there's trouble at the airport because that's where he is and he's got the scanner and it's like well it's just walk on over and then Again, that moment where he goes, can I make a suggestion? And the next thing, he's in the outfit. You're like, oh, they just have to have the perfect fitting, of the, you know, six foot whatever. Uh, and, but that whole sequence, because it's it's the classic clip of, excuse me, this is a crazy question, but do you know how to fly a plane? No. Well, it's the little things, right? In that moment where he's still like chewing on his burger and he's like, I really didn't want to get up for this, but you guys seem to be having some kind of problem here. Maybe I can. You know, and this is like the days before airport police. So he's, and I love that the guy happens to be on the phone. One of your uh, guys was here, an inspector Callahan, and it cuts oh, right to Briggs just going, what? You know, he's <laughs> out. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and the whole burger <laughs> thing, too, is, is after uh, uh, they see the dead bodies in the car and his partner can't eat. Yeah, and comes yeah. in like, Eating what he made. I don't know. And then even the cops going, God, they must have looked like chopped liver. You know, we got uh, garlic bread and chili today. <laughs> I can't, I can't eat. Now, what did he say? He said he said something like uh what ripe melons. Yeah. <laughs> heads look like ripe melon. Must have looked yeah. like a Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Oh god. I love when he's like, How can you eat after you've seen something like that? He's like, seen what? Yeah. Like, anyway, favorite. All right, so we're gonna turn it over to you, Ian. You got your favorite moment out of this? 
Yeah, I actually really liked uh as far as moments go, it was that moment I was talking about earlier when he when he, he they shoot uh when they shoot what is it what's his name? Weeks. Meeks. Sweet. Is it the cop that stands by the door? Right. Sweet, thank you. When they kill Sweet, um, when he's standing there and he says, Hey, yeah, we got a warrant for your arrest, and the guy's like, I'm just a night watchman. You know, that whole I like the I liked that whole sequence. It was a good sequence, but um I like that moment because it surprised me, it shocked me, and it, it made me doubt. You know what I what I had, had thought I'd already figured out. Who called in the tip? Good question. I like right. Who sacrificed Sweet? Oh, I don't know. Because I guess I guess Eastwood compl- says later, well, they sacrificed him. It was so obviously they called, they called it in. Might have been Briggs or one of the yeah. It was yeah. One of the yeah. So they called it in. I would have to say if I was guessing, I'd say Briggs, but yeah. they're not going to call it in on their own buddy, right? And then Briggs explains to them, hey, we have yeah. to do this. So- for the greater good, right? Yeah. By the way, they cast those. What's that? I don't know how you agree with that, right? Like if one of your four amigos gets blasted and you're like, well, okay, it's for the greater good. Well, uh, I- we're going to have real problem at, at HQ if that's the way it goes down later. But that's I'm with you. That doesn't. That's not something we do. <laughs> we don't sacrifice our guys to make a point. Well, and if they know there's going to be a shootout, that was my one problem there too. You don't knock on the door and stand in front of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You think he'd be leaning? We had it top. coming, really. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Darwin Award this week. <laughs> there was a uh, there David was a Soul uh, during that kind of like David Soul like doesn't really. And at one point, he's crouched down and he finally breaks in and kills two guys. Mm. But he's kind of standing there for a while, going, "Uh, uh." Was there something that was going to play off of him being nearsighted? Did I miss that? Because he does make a big deal out of that in that it's one. Such a big yeah. deal, and it's never paid back hmm. later. Does he take? Oh, I'm nearsighted. Yeah. He like, takes it off. Puts it It'd be on. interesting to see what didn't make it into the film. Yeah, I was reading. I was watching it on Amazon, and Amazon had this really cool thing. Whereas, if you ran your cursor over the screen, facts or trivia would pop up about the oh, film. Really? At whatever moment was happening. Um, and I saw it in the beginning, and then I, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, then yeah. I got caught up in the film, and then I paused it at one point, and I put, clicked it back on, and then it had this really cool uh, trivia on there that it was saying two scenes were cut. Two scenes were cut that were that were feeding that thread of the four cops being, being like giving you a little more padding on them being the ones in Callahan figuring it out. And there was one scene where he goes to the with the blonde cop that's soul right mm-hmm. where he goes after the after they they he kills uh the best friend and you're at the airport and they're sending his body off and the wife's crying and and then sweet's like oh, i not sweet sorry but uh soul's like oh i feel somewhat surprised responsible yeah. somehow. um that scene after that they walk off and apparently they went to a they went to a diner or a bar and had a drink. And while they were having a drink, a tussle breaks out. Um, three black guys are being uh, attacked by a bunch of toughs that are in the bar. Um, and apparently, you know, Sweet loses his shit. Callahan beats one with his beer bottle. And then Sweet beats or Soul beats the shit out of the other two guys and then it pours out into the street and apparently the pedestrians are just kind of standing around watching and after he beats the two guys up uh david soul's character turns to the pedestrians who were just standing there watching and berates them for not helping why why wouldn't they help why this is what you know this is the problem you guys aren't trying to police your own Mm police your own like you're just letting these toughs come in here and be dickheads to these guys for no reason and that's where callahan apparently gets the i gets the first idea that uh, it's probably these fucking guys Interesting. and then there was another scene they said they took out where uh it was something with a bullet it was something else with the bullet there was another there was another bit with the bullet uh but but then they said they cut those two scenes out because they just thought it was more padding and you didn't need it did you notice that with both the prostitute is killed and her pimp, that they both die with one arm out of the car? Hey, that's a very popular way to die, okay? No, but it was it was wonderfully dramatic because it's like on the ceiling and then... 
<laughs> and the pimp does the same way. It's like, oh. yeah. It's like exactly this. It's almost exactly yeah. the same. And they're like almost back to back. And that actor who plays that pimp is in all the Dirty Harry movies. Is he really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's the I gotta know guy. Over right? and over again. Yeah. He's the I gotta know. And he, then he's his partner in Sudden Impact. No, yeah. Okay. So he, yeah, he shows up in four of them. I don't know if he's in Deadpool. I think maybe that's the one he couldn't do, but. He's in all four movies. By the way, it's not a smart investment to kill a prostitute who's making you that kind of money. I mean, yeah, she, she was doing she it was right. Making serious cheddar. Like, yeah, right. I think he's jumping the gun a little bit there. Like maybe slow down and rethink this. But anyway, you were going to say something, Jerry? That was the, the, a couple of things. That's, um, the way she was counting the money, I was like, oh yeah, 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 no, no, no. Um, but the pimp guy is the guy that says, "I gotta know." Yeah. Okay, like, this gun holds six or seven shots, and all this excitement. Yep. I can't, oh, wow. that's, that's him. Wow. Um, and then Ian, to talk about your scene with David Soul, when he goes, if I could have got there earlier, I almost feel responsible. And Clint just does this like. Yeah. <laughs> looks at, And again, it was like, no dialogue, nothing, but he's kind of go, what the, f like, it just has that, there's something weird going on here. Yeah. That's it. Nothing more. Do you remember that Dirty Harry moment in the following movie, Enforcer? And I know it wasn't on the program for today's viewing, but where he gets a call or he intercepts a call or ends up at a restaurant where a guy's faked a heart attack to get out of paying the bill. And Harry knows him from doing this, so he starts kicking him awake. And everyone's like appalled that he's kicking this heart attack victim on the floor. And he's like, get up, get up, come on. And he finally gets him up and throws him out. Do you remember that moment? I don't I know, know that. But I gotta watch it again. I gotta watch it again. And then, yeah. I think I'm pretty sure like, it's the Enforcer where they do that. Is it sudden impact where he gets tied up and the one girl like gets on top of him, and then there's like the guy that paints the car the the Ferrari green. That's a rookie, I think. Is that the rookie? Yeah, that might be the rookie because that's a is that what Braga who plays that part? Is that who we're thinking of the actress? But there's also Tightrope, which I think is another Dirty Harry esque uh -huh. movie he did. I and I confuse them all too, man. When I start thinking about this, but uh, the you know, I'll tell you this: these actors they walked away from the Dirty Harry movies with the best real clip. Oh yeah, <laughs> they had the best real moments. Like they could just put to put that in their real. Gosh, man, all the great like acting there's off Dirty Harry's gold, you know. Especially the whole make my day and sudden impact where he's like, what do you mean we, sucker? And he's like, goes through the diatribe of names while he's slowly reaching for his gun and putting his coffee down. Like, this guy can't go anywhere in this town without some kind of crime taking place. Is that the one where he goes, Smith and Wesson can't let you walk out of here? Yeah, yeah. Me, Smith, Wesson. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant stuff, man. What were you going to say, Jeremy? You got some? Um... What there uh was it Hollywood Shuffle? Uh they did a segment called Sneaking Into the Movies, which yeah. was uh, uh a takeoff of Siskel and Ebert, but kind of a ghetto version. <laughs> they they should they'd show a mock-up dirty Harry scene where it's like, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. They go, What is that last one? It's classic. Oh. Well, you you worked with the guy, man. So uh Give us some Clint Eastwood moments, man. Give us a candid moment of uh, being on the set. What you worked with them twice or three times? Yeah, yeah I worked with them. Oh, I, I yeah, I'll tell you the the improv story. Um, because his his working with horses, he never says action or cut. He just says when you're ready, mm -hmm. and then when the scene plays out, he just lets the camera roll in case, and then eventually he'll just say like either thank you or. You'll see some movement. So there's a lot of time. And if you're an actor that likes to play there, it's great. Because there's like, it, it's not like someone's going to say, mm, you're, you, you went on past. Blah, blah, blah. So I have a showdown with the boys that didn't pay their hotel bill. And I start at living at the end because they're trying to bribe me and pay me out. And, and I start saying, you know, you don't want to be, uh, and again, I'm getting into Clinton. No, you don't want to be. Um, I said, uh, you don't want to be singing no jailhouse rock tonight. And I start making little reference, like musical references at the end of the scene. And I, um, oh, and I, I, he's bribing me. And I said, uh, uh, one point I did, I, I said, uh, are you trying to make my day? And Clint comes up to me after that take and he goes, 
You got it in, did you? <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I was like, yeah, I wanted to. And then he goes, he goes, and I love it because he called me Jer. He says, Jer, do you think you could get big girls don't cry in there? And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God. He asked <laughs> me for an improv. Like, fuck. And it's I got, and I don't want to just like, hey, big girls are like, I I'm working with this actor. He was really good. I, I can't remember the actor's name, but we were going back and forth at the end of this, and I finally just got it in, like, well, you know what they say, big girls don't cry, or something to that effect. And he's like, Thank you. Is like, that oh, the one they used? Is that the cut they used? No, no, that, it wasn't in the movie. It was cut down, like, yeah, but that's that's the fun stuff that he has. Um you no, know, it's uh well as 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 we talked earlier, um day one, I was the first one of the first actors to arrive in High River, Alberta. And I go through hair and makeup and I come out and there were compound was just the trucks and then there was a big square in the center. And there's Clint, uh Richard Harris, Gene Hackman, and Francis Fisher in a clump talking. And uh I walk over uh and I just walked over to Clint and I just said, because you don't meet him during the process. Because too many actors right. get like, uh. so I said, hey, I'm Jeremy Ratchford and playing Deputy Gandhi and he uh, another deputy I gotta kill. And I was just like, oh fuck, right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, he gives me a clip line. Yeah. Hackman comes across and goes, Gene Hackman. And I was like, like I, 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 I ran through so much because I was like, no fucking guff, Gene Hackman. But I was like, you know what? Thank you for introducing yourself to me. Like that's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a class act is, and I was, you know, keeping myself puckered. Uh, Said I to Frank Fisher, and Richard is like, Richard, yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, you're great. And I saw him later. Uh, I saw Harris later. We went to the hotel. We were at a motel. He was at the nicer joint. It had the bar. There was a legion in a bar. And uh, we were walking through the four deputies. Well, this is, I'm going to tell a little bit here, but um, we see him. He's having dinner with his assistant. And we walk over and he's like, oh, da, 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 da. and I told him that my first morning uh, at 645 in the morning, the the tractor or the, 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 the truck front of an 18 wheeler was parked in our motel and the smokestacks were blowing straight into my room on the second floor. And I just was like, hi, 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 hi. I got up going, Jesus, this is the big time. Mm-hmm. And I said that to Harris. Like, oh, this morning this happened. He goes, you've got your first story. And that's when he and I, what became, I spent two weeks with him. Uh, uh, this, this, you guys will love this as, as, as movie goes. I had to come in. It was that introduction scene of uh, Hand Over Your Guns. And they needed an insert close-up. And for seven days, I went to set uh that weren't had, had not been scheduled and if the cloud didn't break a certain way before 11 30 which is what they needed light wise it was like okay you're out for the day so i was in seven days and it was just harris and i chatting uh and he told oh god it just told thousands and thousands of stories um uh, uh wait on this harris note though i don't know if you know but i did roger moore's final interview two days before he died. And we asked him, Adrian Paul Highlander was my co-host for it. And we asked him about Harris because they were in a little, little known, awesome movie based on a really good book too, by the way, called the wild geese in the seventies, terrible title, but an incredible movie. And so I asked him about Harris because Burton was on the film too. And Hardy Krueger. And he said, Richard is great to work with. But the liquor store around him is always empty. I just thought that was kind of a funny way to talk about him. Yeah, uh, he's he great was, to work with, but the liquor store around him is always empty. He was sober uh, when I worked with him, uh, but I knew an AD back in Toronto too that they were working with him, and they could never. He was never at his hotel. He was wherever he was, and he'd say, "This is before cell phones and all that stuff." Like, Could you give us like four? areas we might look for you tomorrow morning to get you to work like it's just was he on time was he on time to the set on that 
Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. He's a pro, right? Okay, good. That's infuriating. Well, that's actually one of my favorite little bits there, too. Um, so they would get us up on set, get us all ready, and then the A team would come in, Clint and Gene. Mm -hmm. So on that one day, I'm there, uh, and it's, I don't realize it, but they've been looking for me. Uh, they've been looking for me to get me set up before they bring Harris up. So all of a sudden, it's uh, and it's it was it was beautiful timing because I'm I, I, I'm uh, I'm very dedicated on set, but I was now in Richard Harris's Winnebago, and we're, he's just talking and dead. I'm loving it. And they come to give him a warning, and they go, "Oh, oh, Jeremy, you're here. We've been looking for you." And he goes, Richard, he goes, yes, 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 Jeremy's with me. Um, get, 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 get Jeremy. We're going to get a sandwich, Jeremy. Could you get Jeremy a sandwich? And all of a sudden, he was, I was his boy. I was his minion. And he was like, he knew exactly what was going on. I was going to ride up with him. I was kind of in, being invited to the A-team for, for those few days. Uh, he was just fucking gorgeous. So this makes me think that one of our movies on the horizon to look at has got to be Orca. Because that's a Richard Harris classic, baby, with the killer whale. I've seen it. Orca. You guys haven't seen it? Oh, Bo Derek. Yeah, gets the leg bit, straight leg. And Harris. Will Sampson is like the native Indian guide to right, who knows like the mist, like the the mystery of the killer whale. It's like Jaws, but with the killer. Now I'm telling you guys now, it's horrific, but it's you guys probably really enjoy watching it just for the laughs. You know, well, it's it's the best. I mean it's the best setup in the world. He viciously murders the baby whale and the whale goes nuts. I can't and believe you like, remember it. Oh God, yeah, because there was a great, because there's a point and it's cold and Harris loses it. It's now, it's his epic. And all of a sudden you look across and there's this iceberg that's mm -hmm. moving towards the boat. <laughs> right. Up. Like everything else is flowing that way, but the iceberg's coming the wrong way. And you're going, it's the fucking whale. <laughs> oh, it's that. I love that movie. Yeah, and Will Sampson is in it too. And he's in another great movie like this Man Against Beast type film, which was uh, White Buffalo with Bronson. Oh, I like that movie a lot. Yeah, it's really actually, I mean, I think they focus on the buffalo a little too much. They kind of rob you a little bit, but man, it's entertaining. They the, the whole thing that like he's Wild Bill Hickok, but under a different name and he's crazy. Anyway, those, see the wild geese though. One of the best movies ever. Nineteen seventies mercenaries in action in Africa. I uh, jotted it down. Ethan, what era did you work for Milius? So I was with Milius around two thousand. Well, actually, I started loitering in his office around two thousand when I joined the Warner Brothers Courier Department, um, and I worked with him up until about two thousand and four. And then I had my own office, but saw him all the time there because we were right across the golf cart path from each other. Um, but just an absolute privilege to to be around. One of the all-time great. What sucks is at the time, um, right around the time Jeff Robinoff started running the studio, and he was the Warshawski's agent, he took over for Lorenzo de Bonaventura. And a guy who's been on the show quite a bit, Billy Gerber. And um, so things kind of shifted at the time because they didn't really respect Milius. He was kind of seen as this old antagonistic guard and they didn't really give him the meetings he wanted. And Milius had all these fantastic scripts that were unproduced. Daniel Boone, Sante. Sante being the most intriguing because that's the Vietnam War American POW rescue mission where we land on the ground and face the Russians, Russian military advisors. And he had this great script about that, that action. And he had another script about like the French Foreign Legion fighting in Mexico to the last man like some real battle where they like when mexico when france invaded mexico as a call and tried to make it a colony like around i don't know the 1860s or something wow that recent 1860s uh, maybe before that it was civil war it was civil war when france controlled mexico that's incredible i've never yeah and that's what actually Major Dundee by peckinpah kind of highlights it's all about the chuck heston film that peckinpah directed it's all about you know, going down to Mexico when it was under French control, you know, to chase renegade Native Americans that were causing havoc. But Milius had all these great unproduced scripts and he could not get a meeting, you know, and uh, it was really frustrating. You know, and the Warshawskis were talking about doing a sequel to Conan called King, Co uh, King Conan Crown of Iron. 
And um sounds fucking awesome. I love that title already. <laughs> yeah, and I remember Milius wrote wrote the script and he put all these Frank Frank Vanzetta like art in the script. And it was one of the first times I thumbed through a script because you could go to the Warner Brothers story department and they'd hand you any script if you want. Like I had Beetlejuice 2, whatever was interesting, they'd hand it to you and print it up for you to go read. And I remember like I looked at this one and he had all these all this art in it. And I'm like, damn, look at all this. You've got all the visuals here. And he was talking to Triple H, who I had to go get uh, for the meeting to be like the new Conan the Barbarian, basically, with Arnold having kind of a senior advisor role. And I remember, you know, I'd worked for Arnold, too, but on his lesser known movie, which was Collateral Damage, the one everyone forgets. And I remember telling Milius, because I worked during the days for producer Steve Ruther under Siege, Pretty Woman. And then Milius would come in at about four o'clock. And I'd shift over around five to his office till 10. And uh, I remember uh, Schwarzenegger's on to do reshoots for uh, collateral damage. And I tell Milius, I'm like, hey, your boy's here. He's like, well, let's go see him. Because he's like Hemingway. So we get on my golf cart and we go down to stage eight where they're shooting $12 million worth of reshoots on this bullshit fucking movie of which Maria Schreiber wrote a draft. 11 writers. One of them was Maria Shriver. So this is kind of like one of those arguments. Bill Daly, the senior VP of Warner Brothers, does this show all the time. We talk about this. Is $2 million going to make a movie from an F to an A? Because if it's only going to make it from an F to a D, you don't get the money. Fuck it. And this was one of those scenarios where we're doing eight, like $12 million on a movie that sucks. And uh, so we get down there, and there's like a David Spade guy with the headset who's like, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, so who was sorry? Who, who are you? What are you doing here outside the stage? And Milius has got like his cigar, non smoking lot. He's like, I'm here to see Schwarzenegger. And the guy's like, All right, doesn't know who Milius is, right? So you know, this is cooking up to go south. Wow. And he's like, <laughs> And he's doing a David Spade, like, All right, and you are. And Milius just takes the stub of his cigar out of his mouth and just goes, and like exhales all the smoke in this kid's face. It goes, just tell his boss is here. <laughs> you know, and, the, and I'm like sitting there going, oh man. And so this guy's like coughing up a lung, you know, and Milius is like, I'm waiting, I'm looking around to see who else is going to get in on this. We're standing in front of a stage, but Mil Schwarzenegger was in the trailer outside. We didn't realize that was his because it was nondescript for the reshoots. And Schwarzenegger pops out. And he's like, what's going on out here? You know, and <laughs> Milius like goes, they they meet up again and Schwarzenegger goes, <laughs> um, they start talking and Schwarzenegger introduces me and Arnold puts his hands on my shoulders and he goes, you got good shoulders. And I was actually kind of shocked that I was two inches taller than him because I looked at Arnold as like this mammoth of a human being. But as you guys probably know, when you're in the room, it gets much more modest, right? So I was kind of blown away. Well, wait, how tall are you? I'm 6'3". And, and so they say Arnold's six two, but you think he's around six foot. I think he's about. Six, I think he comes to here, but not to take anything away from the dude because he's yeah. like larger than life. Yeah. But I was kind of surprised, and you know the thing I loved about him is he would work out in the fitness center, like he, like if he saw you in there, Asham, he'd be like, "Here, do this." He'd give you something to do, oh, and he'd great. do it with you. I'd love. There, like, there was no barriers. He would talk to the janitor the same way he talked to the head of the studio, and that I really respected. But he puts his hand on my shoulders and goes. You could you got good shoulders. But then he points at my gut and goes, but you look like you've been relaxing. <laughs> and then he goes to John Milius. He goes, and you, you look like you have half the Atlantic Ocean in you. <laughs> Just like this derogatory stuff. Anyway, I don't know how we got on that diatribe, but Milius was, you know, incredibly gracious, really underappreciated at the time. Filmmakers like yourselves, like genuine filmmakers, you guys are artisans. Like, you know what he's done and what he respected, but there was also kind of like this modern day, like agency type click that was like the assistance pool, I would say. And they didn't know shit. They thought they were talking to some dinosaur out of a trailer park. And I'd have to, you know, we would get into it with them all the time because the guy was responsible for all these works of art we grew up on. Apocalypse, Conan, Red Dawn. And in that building also was Mark Canton and he had a bunch of assistants that I felt were right out of the mailroom at CAA. No respect to, no disrespect to them, but they just didn't have appreciation for film. They just, they wanted the business, you know? Does that make sense? Yep. Oh, yeah. It was like about, can they do a deal and produce something? They didn't know. They didn't care about, anyway. 
it's boring stuff, I know, but. Uh, well, do you think that because, I mean, John always encouraged, or I think he encouraged the controversy, right? He embraced it. But I think it unfairly cut his career a little bit short. We were just talking about that, too, because um, he had just finished the Rough Riders when I started working with him, and he was doing a rewrite for Mike Newell. Uh, on a Western and uh, Bill Daly and I were talking because Bill Daly was at the studio as a senior VP for years. And we were talking about how much we both loved him and how he was really misrepresented in the minds of the brass as they had him pegged as some sort of barbarian fascist. And he was really none of those things. Like a lot of what comes across and he didn't like to do interviews because he said he came across all wrong. Um, which he did. He was really, a lot of it was kind of sense of humor. Like it was like you were saying with the gauntlet, like you kind of think Clint's winking, winking at you when it, during the movie. Oh yeah. Like that's how I think Milius was in a lot of these interviews when he was talking about things, he'd kind of be like, you know, like yeah, to see if the, I mean, to tell you, I'll give you a 30 second story. that tells you everything you need to know about Milius. You guys have probably met him and know anyway, but I haven't, well, we I, haven't I've him. seen so many yeah, interviews man. with them and his and fans man's work so much. Oh, He's unreal. And I mean, what's really sad to me is the movies he did not get a chance to make seem to be like the best ideas where that, that was what was around his office. These things that the studio thought was too expensive. He was out of favor to do. Those were like the greatest movies you'd hope to see. But the assistant at Bel Air Productions building 90 at Warner Brothers for Steve Ruth or the receptionist knew I worked for Milius at night and goes, you got to introduce me to him. I love all his movies. You got to introduce me to him. And after like a few days of nagging, I'm like, all right, come on. We'll go over there on our lunch break. We'll take a late lunch and he'll be in there around four. And you can always tell Milius his office because it had the sticker property, the Hell's Angels on the door. <laughs> so I knock on the door and no one's answering. So I'm, and I knock again and I'm like, okay, they're not here yet. But all of a sudden the door cracks open and it's Millie's his assistant, Leonard, and he's like, he sees it's me, and he opens it up. He's like, Ethan, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, this is a guy I work with over at Bel Air, Bel Air Productions, not the neighborhood. He wants to meet John. And Millie's was always good about that. You could just knock on his door and say you wanted to talk or meet him, and if he had time, you'd sit on his couch. He'd love to talk. So if you guys were in that building, you'd probably have dozens and dozens of conversations with him. I wish we were. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and this is funny, because it was like, we get rushed in and the door slammed behind us and they're putting together a sniper's rifle on his desk from okay. like FedEx gun parts that when the days when you could do that and this receptionist like starts to panic, but Milius detects that this guy's on edge. So he doesn't stop working on the gun. And I was like, John, this guy wanted to meet you real quick. And I understand there's some theatrics here, but this guy doesn't know. So I'm like, this guy wants to meet you. And John's like cranking on the scope. He's like, yeah, how you doing? And he goes back to working on the gun. And he's like, well, uh, he's getting visibly nervous. He's like, I just wanted to say I'm a big fan of your work. And then he throws the gun to his assistant, Leonard. He's like, Leonard, test out that scope. Leonard pushes open the window, which overlooks Olive Boulevard, and starts sticking the gun out and, like, starts following traffic, like, cars. And they're, like, talking in there. He's like, and then Millie says, like, you know, I wonder if those saw guys have any of those armor-piercing rounds. It'd be nice to get our hands on some of that because I think those are illegal in the state of California, aren't they? And this guy's like literally trembling. And I'm like thinking in my head, like, I get it, right? They're just putting on a show for this dude. Um, and so anyway, the guy we start walking out, and Millie's goes, Hey, nice to meet you. And Ethan, go ahead and give your friend the warning. We expect all your friends to know. And I'm out in the hallway. And my this guy goes, Wow, that was that was really interesting. Um, what was what did he mean when he said warning? And I said, well, if you tell anyone about what you witnessed in there, he'll kill you. And it's like, that's like my part of the act, you know, but it's like, obviously the whole thing is a put on, but that's how he was. Like so much of it was just for like your theatrical enjoyment. He yeah. knew he was kind of a character in your Milius movie. Yeah. You know, kind of like what Gary Busey does to an obnoxious level. Milius would do at just the right level for you, you know? <laughs> I mean, there's that amazing sense, moment like, in like fog city mavericks or yeah it was like a doc when he they're like yeah about how he was gonna first do how they were gonna first he and lucas were gonna shoot uh apocalypse now and that he's might like, be in hearts of darkness that he's talking about when they get to vietnam shoot it just before tet <laughs> yeah. 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 just before tet <laughs> you're like what 
or just in time like for it. Yeah, he's always he like he wants you know, and he's he is kind of almost laughing when he says that. So I mean, to your to your story, like, I, yeah, yeah. I, like like for me, like and when you like, like you listen to Spielberg talk about him and stuff like that, like he always says he was kind of a ham. Yeah, I think he so always, too. Yeah, he was always goofing around. So I think ninety percent of it is him having a good time with the subject and yeah. the subject matter, and. I think that's also why I just absolutely love the guy of all the personalities at Warner Brothers I mixed in. And Eastwood was there too. Uh, Joel Cox, his editor, was great. All those guys were really generous with their time. But, you know, you walk away from Milius going, that guy wants to make sure you remember him in all the right ways. Yeah, Like he extends this Milius kind of aura to you to kind of be like, and take that one back to your friends. You know, like you know what I mean. It's, it's a performance, right? Yeah, he, yeah. He has a persona that he's mastered and is like putting out there. Yeah, such right. gold. I mean, the funny thing about it is, I was fired from the courier department for a time clock infraction, and largely because I was trying to work my way in with him. Oh wow! And I remember, like, the dispatcher calling me on the radio the day I had to get Triple H for the Conan meeting. I go into Millie's office. And just say, hey, do you need anything? That was my like MO. I would walk by all the producers and just knock on their door and say, do you need anything? Even though I don't technically work for them, I just wanted them to get to know my face. So I'd be like, hey, do you need anything? And John Millis goes, yeah, Triple H is down by the hot dog stand. He can't find us. Go get him on your golf cart and bring him up here. We've got to talk to him about Conan the Barbarian. And I'm like, right. Now I'm on the clock. So I go down and I see Triple H and his agent at the hot dog stand, which we probably all know at Warner Brothers. And I'm like, hey, I'm from John's office. Get on the golf cart. I'll take you up. I take him up, take him back to the office, and I'm getting ready to report back to the courier department where I belong. But Milius says, uh, Ethan, why don't you stick around for this? And so in my head, I'm like, oh, shit. But I'm also thinking, like, this might be my break. I should stick around. He's telling me to stick around, right? What do you guys do in this situation? Ian, what do you do? I stick around. You stick around? <laughs> so I'm, like, thinking, like, all right. And I hear, I turn down my interview, my radio, my walkie talkie, and I hear them saying like, Ethan, where are you? And I'm like, click. So I sit in the meeting and it goes on for about an hour and a half and I'm dying in it. Yes. And I drive back to the courier department going, I'm going to get fired. And I walk in and the dispatcher goes, it's like Hill Street Blues. It's like a taxi setup in there, you know, like the Louis De Palma cage kind of deal. And then he like sticks his hand out the windows. Where the fuck have you been? And I'm like, dude, you're never going to believe it. I was, I went by Milius's office to see if he needed anything. He sent me to go get Triple H, the wrestler, get him back to his office for a meeting about Conan the Barbarian. And he told me to stay for the meeting. And he's like, you're so full of shit. You are so full. Of if that actually happened, take me up there right now. I want to hear it from Milius. And he doesn't know Milius. I want you to introduce me to him. Let's see if you even know him. And then I want to hear it from Milius. And I'm like, oh, all right, come on. And he gets on the golf cart with me. And the whole way we're driving back to building 81, he's like, you are so fucking fired. This is going to be the most enjoyable moment of my life. This day is going to live in infamy at the courier department. You are so fucking fired. You have abused your privileges for the last time. You are a dumb son of a bitch. And we stay, even as we park and we're walking down the hallway to Milius' office, he's still riding me. He's like, you are, this is, oh, this is great. He's like, you want to stand outside the door for a little bit before you're fired? Or do you want to just go in and let me fire you? So I knock on the door and Leonard, the assistant, his buddy from Hawaii, who's in Conan the Barbarian, by the way, goes, Ethan, what are you doing back here? And I'm like, this is my boss. He just he kind of wanted to verify that we just had this Triple H, Conan the Barbarian. He wants to talk to John. And he's like, yeah, he's in there. Go ahead. So I go in there and John has a newspaper out. And does like the thing where like it comes down just below the eyes, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And so I come in with John and now, and, and, and the current, my boss, the dispatchers kind of got quiet. His name is John Lawrence though. His name. And I want to say his name for a reason coming up. And I go, uh, John, this is my boss I'm down at the Curry department, John and John Milius immediately puts the paper down and gets, up, goes, Oh, Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And he gets it right away. He can, I guess, read our body language. He goes, by the way, we really like this kid here. We really like him. He's helped us out quite a bit. He's one of our favorite people around here. And the dispatcher, John Lawrence, goes, um, 
well, uh, sir, anytime, anytime you need them, just let me know and I'll send them right up. <laughs> now that's funny because we walk out of the office and props to John understanding right away what was happening there. We walk right out of the office and when the office door closes, the reason I mentioned this guy's name is he's a rarity in our business because he immediately goes, you son of a bitch, you were telling the truth. He's like, you're going to make something of yourself. He's like, you got to do whatever they ask you. I'll cover for you. Whatever they ask you, I'll lie. He's like, you're going to, you're going to make it, you know, he, and totally was, was not fired for that. Yeah. It was like one of those endearing moments where I thought, oh shit. Cause you know, most people, they get embarrassed and they're going to make that, they're going to hammer it home. But I just remember th he was so generous and he goes, whatever, if he calls you, you just let me know. We'll work out a code and you can do whatever you need to do. And ultimately I did start working up there, but. It was kind of one of those funny moments where he's like, you're fired. You are so fired. You've been lying. I cannot wait to see your face when I fire you. <laughs> you know? to, Holy shit, you're going to make something of yourself. I got I to gotta play a role. And he did cover for me a lot as much as he could, you know, before it finally got so ridiculous where like the Warner Brothers were like, what are you doing on the time clock at nine o'clock at night? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, um... How do I explain? Should I just leave now? <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry to bore you guys. I oh, guess I just love the guy so much. It's hard not to, you know, when people ask, it's hard not to say yeah. some sort of, anyway. He would love you guys. We got to set up a meeting. He'd love you guys. Really? He would love to meet him. Yeah. He'd love it. Yeah. Honestly, I know he had, he had a, a stroke, right? Yeah. How is, and, has he been able to recover from that? Is he able to, to so power of the vocabulary back and stuff like that? He, my understanding is from his son, his son tipped me off, said, who's a district attorney. And he was prosecuting the, the case of the HBO miniseries guy, the old guy that killed the couple that confessed at the last episode. Do you know the episode I'm talking about? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So Millie's son, who's also named Ethan, was prosecuting that. But he told me that he's pretty, he's getting better. He can say some things. Originally, Perry Lang, have you guys ever worked with Perry? He called me and said, Perry Lang was in Big Wednesday. He's a director now for TV, but he's in a lot of movies. I eat men out. And yeah. he called me and said, um, uh, John Milius doesn't even remember me. And we were like, oh, shit. Like, that sounded bad. It's like, I saw him. I tried to thank him at Paramount or something. He doesn't even remember me. But I think he is getting a lot of his faculties back. Have you seen that documentary they did on him? Yeah, it's so powerful. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should do Amelia's show. And actually, we'll end the show with him chiming in. We'll set it up where he can probably get involved in some way. Oh, amazing. What a legend. Yeah, I'll see what I can. I'll see what I can. I'll see what I can arrange. But uh, anyway, I'm, I apologize for going down that rabbit hole. I'm no, no. sorry. Welcome rabbit hole. Uh, but uh, very so, much missed. There's one thing I wanted to address in the gauntlet that we didn't talk about that just flew into my brain a little while ago and i was like oh i gotta mention that there was an interesting theme of like god running through it and there was it was like it was kind of kidding on a square with the the first one you see right is like god makes house calls or doesn't make mm -hmm. house calls or i fucking can't remember what it said but it said something about god and house calls i think and then the second one was like the other sign you see where it's like uh isn't it after somebody gets whacked and there was like a they cut to this sign and pan off of it or something and i can't remember what it said but another god like God is your savior or something like that. And then yeah. he says it to the bikers, see the gods in my green eyes or whatever the fuck he says to them. Right, yeah. And then there was uh one in the town where they got the bus. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was and then there was a hit at the very end or something, right? Where somebody says, I think it's Eastwood says something like, Well, you just gotta have faith, or something like that when they're when they're rolling in, uh, that they were gonna make it out of there. Uh, pretty interesting that they decided to thread that in when well, it... It, it was almost as blatant as the tab. Sure. Yeah. Because it was like crossing and it's like, it's a billboard. Yeah. Yes. And again, that to kind of go on that, but that tab, that tab can on the front. And, and then when they get back in the car after uh, the phone call, that's when he takes it, sips it, and then what? He, he just. Threw it Throws on the away. floor. It's like we gotta get this out of this shot, man. Yeah. So Obviously, why do you think that? Why do you think that theme's there? Just for artistic reasons, or was there more to it? Do you think? 
Uh, I think that they had this sort of, they had this motif that they were playing with that like, you know, you had to have faith in a tough situation and they start building with the God stuff and they start building with a guy who's obviously mm. really down in a bar, you know, in the, in a depression state, not liking his life. Not like, and then by the end, you know, he's, he's, you sort of have faith that it's all going to work out, I think is what I've sort of took from it, but not only in the, in the in the in the bus that he was going to make it out of there alive but that he was going to find somebody because wasn't there a whole scene too where he was like oh i tried to find a woman and she just i couldn't fucking make it work or whatever yeah Talking this line of work um that he had needed to have faith and hang in there and the right person was going to show up and like you know there she is it's somebody he's got a he's got a job this divine okay. path man yeah. yeah almost full circle again in uh magnum force when we go back to his kitchen and bed apartment um he sits down on the bed and there's just one picture is that his wife it has to be an ex-wife right yeah. like holding the bouquet or whatever yeah mm. it, it just that made me kind of go it's been so long since i've done these shows but what's what sure, it's what's a egg in there for somebody right it's his wife uh definitely looked too young to be like his mom and i don't think he would have a picture of his sister you know so yeah, and it wouldn't yeah. be a daughter at graduation, but it was like, yeah, yeah, for this guy that's just being hounded by every woman going, it's like oh. it was, there was one that got his heart before, like yeah, I like that. I said, they're like systematically like unwinding all of the original Dirty Harry, like oh he's empathetic, you know, it's like he's hmm. not so extreme in his views. It's it's really interesting. Oh, and that's when he starts eating the cold burger, deciding like lying on his bed, like he doesn't have a couch. Yeah. Oh, what was the other one? I, I was just on. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, in the original Dirty Harry, don't they fall through a window or so into a porn shoot? Should like I... they, they have like some of these these really weird like again with the the couple on the uh on the round oh, bed doing coke. It's just yeah. like there's there's all of a sudden there's these. Little vignettes in the Eastwood movies are like, there's a lot of it's a little. Well, even like, in the, are even they in laying the... in a puddle too. Like, isn't it like a round water bed? Like, it looks like they're like laying in a puddle after the whole. After the guy comes <laughs> oh, in the, the, the water bed <laughs> flat and they're laying in the water of it. That's interesting. There was also in the Suzanne Summers house. Is that really Suzanne Summers house? Why do you guys keep calling it Suzanne Summers house? Oh, well, Suzanne I just said that because she's in the scene. I don't know. Is that what her that it? takes her top off and runs and jumps in the pool? And then gets shot right between the boots. That's freaking hilarious. I mean, what is she like showing everybody her wedding ring? And then all of a sudden she like takes off her top for some reason and decides to jump in the freaking pool. It's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I'm out, dude. <laughs> not like this and then she's in the pool at the end. Another. I'll, I'll tell you another, this. I, the yeah, the night, night, she did a hell of a float job, though. She could float. Boy. I'll tell you this. I've been in Hollywood 20 years. I've never been to a party like that. I guess they just, I'm just in the wrong circles. <laughs> I'm in the wrong circles. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I was trying to figure out what they what did they do to deserve the machine gunning. I was, you know, it's like so these other guys I get, but that yeah. was like, wait a minute, this these guys are just having this is like they're just having a good time on what seemed like a Sunday afternoon. Why are we going to machine gun them? And then there's also I I just sort of to break it down anymore. Here's the the lone cop biker yeah. and black and white, and in that neighborhood, obviously they're you know it's a little spread out, but. And not one person goes, Yeah, we just heard gunfire. And we saw a cop riding away from the scene 10 seconds later. No. Yeah, there's not a lot of like civilian involvement in either one of these movies. But you know what was cool is at the top of the show, I think it was you, Ian, you, you mentioned a lot of good like Firefox films that kids today don't probably even know, like our. Uh, Iger Eastwood Sanction. films, Firefox, Iger Sanction, you know, and I was thinking of some of the more likable ones, uh, less likable ones, like Any Which Way But Loose, or... I loved those as a kid. Esh and I know? loved them. him and Clyde walking around, beating people up. It was amazing. And there was the one where he's like the circus guy, Bronco Billy, remember? I where fucking he's kind of like... really dig that movie as well. There's an amazing scene in Bronco Billy when that cop is trying to test him a cop comes up to him and is like, Bronco Billy, you want a dr quick draw with me? How fast are you? And uh, Clint's character decides to not do it. 
uh, even though you think he could beat the guy, he decides not to test. Like he decides not to do it because he's a good guy. Um, and it's when he's trying to bail. I think it's when he's trying to bail one of his guys out of jail. He's trying to be cool about it. He's trying to talk to the deputy and the deputy or the sheriff's like, I know who you are. And he gets really competitive with him that he's going to quick draw with him. And this is his chance. See if he's the best or whatever. I mean, what a great cast, like to cast him in that role is so smart, right? Because of the legendary, like, Western yeah. has been in and like of course yeah. he can outdraw him but like i don't know it's like a, com- a contemporary but you take all that baggage from everything he's done before it's like the end of the shootist right like where they make john wayne's character as if every movie he did was the same guy remember when they ron howard does that highlight reel in the beginning of the shootist and it's clips from like rio bravo el dorado hondo jesus i and can't it, remember that that's amazing that's a great yeah idea. and it and he, he like narrates him and like so John Wayne's final film it's as if he's been the same legend all along in all these movies and that's why all these guys are coming after him including that actor is the actor with the tab cola he's no one of the he's one of the guys in the shootist that comes after Wayne in the end and uh I think he's in Bronco Billy too now that I think about it but uh yeah they kind of like really kind of like rewrite the legend in that way of like a Hollywood career it's just where they, like you're saying, as he brings like all this, like he just had so much gravitas as that guy that they just played on it and worked so well for the audience. And it does in Bronco Billy too. It's kind of an endearing little movie. I you can't know, that one. it's been a while since I've watched the, the Bronco Sandra Bronco. Locke in that one too, isn't it? Isn't she in that? Yeah, yeah Sandra Locke is in that. Uh, she, yeah, they didn't, I don't think they ended on the best terms, uh, you know, but that's a story for another day, I guess. Uh, so what we have here is you know you can't have these conversations without opening up like a coffin full of options and now you're thinking like god orca wild geese uh like the only show that is seriously considering having a richard harris duel off of movies uh, <laughs> richard harris is with nail and i too right is that him no. yes, who's who's in with nail uh not him, but that with no eyes. I'm making time. Um, was that um, was that, that's not Richard Burton. Um, no, it's uh, huh. British guys. Let me look him up real quick. Oh, I see. This is. I'm glad. <laughs> if only we had a thing. What's that? Is is it the gay uncle? You see, with Neil and I. Here we go. It is. Oh, it's Richard Grant. Richard yeah. Grant and uh, who's the other cat in there with him? It must be Paul McGann. All right, so I'll let you guys pick the movies for the next round because I, I I'm going to cut out a lot of my diatribing out of this episode. This will be a two hour episode cut down to forty five minutes of just you guys talking all about all the awesomeness. Oh no, are you serious? I mean, probably. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. people like the end these days. What's uh, that? People like the conversation meandering. I feel like uh, it, it's, you get a better feel for the people in the in the chat. Uh, man, it's just uh, I mean, it's hard. Like, there's some people you can't mention to me without me like making sure I pay homage or respect I think those are to. Great stories. I would want to hear uh, those stories if I uh, were. Uh, there you know what's funny is of all the people I work with, Steven Seagal is who they people want to hear about the most. For the wrong reasons, and Milius is the one I want to talk about the most because I just loved him so much, still do. But anyway, so what's that? What years did you work with Seagal? Well, that would be around. See, my daughter was three, I think, so about two thousand six, seven, in there. We. Where the heck did we meet over there at Seagal's company? We met somebody at Seagal's company at Steamroller when it was Steamroller. Is it was the office in the valley off of Ventura Boulevard, just a few roads, just a few streets down from? So oddly enough, when I left Warner Brothers, they moved me to the Warner Hollywood lot. His office was there at the time, but I wasn't working with him yet. I would meet him at his house on Mandeville Canyon. Interesting. Because I was just doing like project script doctor work for him. And he still had a deal with Sony at the time. So his office might have been there, but he was. You know, you can't really mention this in front of my wife because she can't stand him or his presence. And she was my partner. So she would go to the meetings where you'd go into this dining room, 
Ratchford, you have to have Seagal stories of anyone who's connected. Who's anyone who's a degree? It has to be you, Ratch. Uh, but you, he like came in in his black pajamas, like a member of the Viet Cong, Amazing. and would like sit at the end of this table in like this throne, like an opium lord. And you know, these meetings would be like eight, nine at night. Um, kind That's of so hilarious, good. you know. But I don't. What's that? The guy's such sounds, a kid. sounds entertaining as heck. Sounds yeah. great. I only well, see. I don't have any firsthand knowledge of him, but I did hear that in the the airplane movie, the, like in like Sky High Air Jack or whatever the fuck. Yeah, the one where he dies yeah. like in the first ten minutes. We well, yeah. yeah. he, he that decision, isn't it? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And supposedly he said he wanted to hold the planes together. So. <laughs> Boxes. That sounds that sounds right on target, right in a sense, yep. but that the reason he died was because he wasn't supposed to be in the movie in the first place. Because this goes back to my Warner Brothers days, they made him do it because he owed overages for directing on Deadly Ground. He owed him half a million dollars in overages on that movie. So the deal was they would forgive those overages if he would jump in this vehicle for Kurt Russell and be like a surprise casting element, and that's why he dies. You we know, love which, that element of that movie, though, that he dies. It's right. such a shock because he was. Yeah, it's great. Moment. You're just like, holy shit, they killed Steven Seagal in five seconds. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, think it's... recently we've seen that with kind of like um, Brad Pitt in that Nebo mm -hmm. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what Lost is it? City. Lost City. There you go. Yep. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Brad, Brad Pitt is like the super duper assassin that comes in to save Sandra Bullock and. And Channing Tatum, but then he say, I think he saves him, helps him out, but then he gets whacked, and you're like, oh shit, he got whacked. Yeah, that was one of the better parts of that movie, if I remember right. It was one of the funnier, yeah, moments. I, I uh, we love those guys. We love the directors. Uh, we met them on a festival run a while ago. Um, back when we were running around with Waffle Street, they were running around with a film called Band of Band of Robbers. Robbers, yeah. Um, yeah, like a, a a retelling of Huck Finn, which was really cool. Um, but yeah, they, they've, they've, they've stepped up that ladder. They're doing some great stuff. I'm excited for this new one. They've got, it's like a lethal weapon film with, uh, with, uh, Ryan Reynolds and Channing Tatum. Nice. I felt like I was watching romancing the stone. Sure. In that. It does right? feel that way, sure. They were very well aware, aware of that, you know, the, the yeah. reference or whatever of it, but. But speaking of not a script that they came, it was not, it, it was a script that they were given. I'm sure they did. I believe they did rewrites on it, but it was, it was not an original from them. It was something that Bullock, I think was pumped to do. Hey, my mother loved it and that counts. So that's a win. It was fun, it was fun to see Bullock back doing her thing. Cause uh, rarely do you get to see a movie like that. That feels very nineties, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was done well for the type of movie it was. It was fun. Speaking of like Huck Finn reimaginings, did you guys see that show a few years back with Jean Claude Van Damme, Jean Va Jean Claude Van Damme Johnson? I've not Peter seen. That. That Do you know that? I think that is Peter. I know, it, I know what it is. I've seen a couple of them. Yeah, where he's called in to be, you know, play Huck Finn in a reimagining of the movie. Yeah, and it's, and it's like shirtless. Yeah, and that's it's all that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. But and he's really an agent, but they have the character in there who in the book is, well, in the movie, in the show, too, he, he's, uh, is it N-Word Charlie? Like, that's his name, N-Word Charlie. And they're like, look, I feel like we're being race, racially insensitive. It's N-Word Charlie. We can't have this. So they call him the N-Word Charlie. That's his name because they had to use N-Word instead of what he's called in the actual Twain book. Yeah, and so they replace him with C word Sam, right? They bring in the the Asian actor, and they they. All right, oh, yeah, I'm going down a Van Dam rabbit hole that maybe we shouldn't, but maybe see that it's got some, you know, it's, it's not, not entirely boring. No, I've seen I've seen at least a couple. Is it one? It's it's a series, right? Right, but then yeah. he he meets himself from the future. He's time cop from the future. The whole thing's a pun on his movies. Okay. So he meets himself and he's like, who are you? He's like, I'm you from the future, like time cop. And then he gets into an argument with the security guard who thinks that uh, the Looper movies are better than time cop <laughs> because be Looper stars Bruce Willis. And he's like, no, no, time cop is the movie that did it before Bruce Willis. You know, he's almost gives himself a, anyway, never mind. It's on <laughs> Amazon for free. If you guys are really bored and drunk, what is that? 
this is what I went as I was uh, uh, deep diving somewhere in the cast, but it's called yeah, Bad Cats, 1980. Jimmy Walker and Michelle Pfeiffer. And it's a band of people that investigate car theft. <laughs> That's definitely got to be on your next list of films you're watching. <laughs> I'm so in. I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I can I can pick these movies because I don't know that I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be watching them. So you guys can't pick, assign homework for people. Well, you know, as somebody who can who would tell you that the best vampire movie has always been Blackula, <laughs> uh, and tell you that in all honesty, uh, I would you know I mean I think we've hit on a few here. Uh, Bad Cat certainly sounds intriguing. I've never seen that, but Orca is terrible in all the right ways, and the Wild Geese is dated but awesome. I don't know. I mean, what you, I think we have to pick is like uh, everyone's got to come together with a movie, but it's usually based on a subject or an actor, and then we find the worst possible credit. I have always, I have, uh, I have pitched this to everyone. Oh, here we go in this fucking room. <laughs> Adios, Sabata. Yeah, I know that's your favorite. I honest to God, because it is, it's insane. It's the best Yule Brenner character introduction. Best mm. villain introduction, and then two hours later, you don't know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it has plagued me my entire life. I own a copy, and it's it's fucking crazy. Isn't Audio. there a couple? There's a couple of those Sabata mo well, movies, there's, though. Yeah, aren't there's there? Sabata, which I think, um, Knife Thrower, the Mag Seven, Coburn. Mm -hmm. I think. Coburn originated the character and then Brenner took it over. Oh wow. But just just his character introduction, and it's gotta be right after the Mag 7, because he's all in black, the hat, and and he like he does yeah. I don't want to ruin it for you, but there's a a cartridge uh for the bullets of his rifle that yeah. I've never before or since well, it's made for the film it's yeah. kind of like woody strode's gun in the opening of once upon a time in the west it's made really for that moment that one moment i think okay it makes no sense in the real world but it's it's it's, it's a good thing to look at i think but yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, i mean it's kind of doing the 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 dirty hairy thing <clears throat> the one thing that I, I always stood out and it kind of it's like a sense memory but the sound of that magnum mm. uh it's like that's a uh it's its own unique sound and it's in all those movies but that that gun sound is is incredible so yule brenner lived right up the street from me as a kid right and um i remember he would let all the neighborhood's kids swim in his pool he was really cool and uh I remember like my parents talking to him and they said, you know, what's your favorite movie that you've been in? And uh, he said Westworld mm. oh, was wow. his favorite, which okay. by the way, I think inspired the Terminator, but I also think was inspired by Pirates of the Caribbean. And I think Crichton pays that back in Jurassic Park with the Jeff Goldblum line. line. But, but he also, the reason I mentioned is because he said there's another movie I like a lot called The Light at the End of the World where he's a pirate captain against yeah. have you seen that where he storms like the lighthouse island so i've it's heard a, of it but i heard the of redux, it on... have seen it it's a redux of the uh, of the uh, what is it there's a there's a Light literature house. that it's based on what is it based on i think it's a jules verne book yeah, isn't it jules verne jules verne. Really correct yeah yeah but yeah he, so he liked kind of like a you know i don't know you'd expect him to say king and i or something right or magnificent seven but it is kind of interesting, I guess. Sometimes the experience, well, Ratchford, you're the actor, but sometimes the experience actors have, I think, sometimes outweighs the film's, you know, audience or box office impact. Like, I would guess, right? And that's probably why he said those movies. Anyway, although Westworld was a hit. Yeah, well, I, I just, for me personally, I did a Christmas movie called Small Gifts, which is still my favorite to date. No, uh, no, no, no. You li you're lying because you told me, uh, Small Town Crime was your favorite. No, ever. no, but I say well, I, I, soon after I did yeah. Highway, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, my character in that because he thought he was Elvis. Or there's a line that goes, that guy thinks he's Elvis. And then yeah. I can tell you, small town crime. And I had a guy, um, oh, this is kind of, <laughs> maybe this is the other angle. There's a, a, a gentleman that's a little older than I am at the gym that I've been working out at, Rick Moses. And he came up to me, he saw a small town crime, and he just went, he said some of the nicest things to me. I'm not going to say them here because it's, I, it, but it was, he was just so incredibly generous. I heard that small town crime is the reason Michael Mann doesn't want to do a sequel to Heat <laughs> because That's, he thinks it's already been done too perfectly in small town. I also heard that Francis Ford Coppola was looking at it as a blueprint for possibly doing Godfather 4. Uh, there's some inspiration there. I don't know. I mean, I hear these things. Uh, I hear these rumblings in our business, but I don't know. Definitely all so, lies. I've been talking with Rick Moses, and he's now spreading the word around the gym. It's his sons that own the gym. But he was like, I, I come up on a conversation with him, and he goes, oh, I was just telling him about your movie. And I was like, oh. And he turned to me just yesterday and said, uh, you know, they ought to do an origins of that character orthopedic. They go back 10 years and just show how he came about. I was like, I'll tell the boys. Yeah. <laughs> but then I told them what I was doing about the, we did uh, uh, Earthquake and Towering Inferno. He's in Avalanche. Wow. A Rock Hudson. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And he's like fourth, fourth on the cast. But I was like, you know what? Maybe we'll do Avalanche. We'll get you in on it. But it was great. That's incredible. But he I think that him. also stars Robert Forster. Yep. Love that man. Yeah. That's Robert oh, Forster. That's that was the connection. Because that's what brought it up. He says, I worked with Robert on a movie called Avalanche. I went, oh fuck, we've been doing because Robert yeah. Forrester famously told me he did he got the black hole script with three blank pages at the end. Oh wow. Wow. And that's why the black hole didn't have the ending in the script and they got the ending they got. So yeah, it comes back around, and he was also before he died a big fan of Small Town Crime. I think he thought it was his favorite movie after Lawrence of Arabia. I'm going to cut all these into sound bites you guys can use please, on your social media. Please do not. <laughs> please do not. That's the first time anyone's actually shied away from me mentioning one of their movies. Uh, but uh, that's, you're getting some what, uh, this has been this has been awesome, Ethan. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Uh, why don't we pick something next? The, through, you guys can pick a couple of things to look at if you want. You know, you know, R Richard, you can let your your directors pick something, right? We can turn it over to them for a, for a show at some point. I, I just have to tell you guys, I have been so excited about doing this with you guys. I'm so glad that we got this opportunity because you know, I love talking movies with you guys, and uh, uh, this has just been a, a dream come true. So thank you. I love it. I was absolutely joy. You know, Jimmy, it's funny because I remember you were hitting me about the gauntlet when we were working on when I saw you recently on EDG. Yeah. And uh and, and you were talking about the gauntlet. And I was like, oh man, I gotta watch that again. So it was a perfect excuse for me to dig into two of films I really had a fond memory of uh and revisit them. Yeah. I would I would suggest the wild geese, which is good, and Orca, which is bad, the link being Richard Harris. Back to Ratchford. I think that's a great. That's a great idea. Do I'm it. Do I it. love Orca, but it's been so long. But yeah, I love because it, it's another one. Um, it, it's it's the just the whale's eye, like <laughs> it's so close up, but it's just like he's going, "I'm gonna kill you." Yeah, but the whale does everything but like light up a smoke and tell you his life story. You know, in the in the it's movie, sort of it's like, like another great character introduction. Just to go on, but the the original Piranha, yeah, it's that classic. The kids are running in the woods at night, and they come across like an abandoned place that has a huge, really uh, not a welcoming swimming pool, but a, a play a cement structure that has water in it. So they go, oh, let's go swimming, and the clothes come off, and they get in the water, and then it's the screen is black. And you just see, just the this. What was it? was it? Tales of the Golden Monkey, where the sumo wrestlers fought on the platform with the piranha. Oh, was I it? don't even. But in the sorry, in piranha. You just see the eyeball, an eye. Oh, it's a fish eye. It's a piranha. Yeah. That's what they're gonna get because it sees you. Yeah. It's got you. 
I've got to watch the original Piranha again, and I've got to watch what did you call? What is that movie? You just said, Ethan. I I said the Wild Geese and Orca, but the Wild Geese is incredible. That's oh, one of the great. Cool. It doesn't fully hold up, but idea wise and concept wise, it's one of my all time favorite movies. I think Ian's asking, what was the sumo fighting about Piranha? Thank you. Oh, Imagine. that was um, I think an episode of Tales of the Golden Monkey. Right where the sumo wrestlers are fight. That's like a pre World War II Flying Tigers TV show from the eighties that didn't really see much light of day, like ten episodes or something. But they were like the it was based on the Flying Tigers during World War II or pre World War II. And there's like two sumo wrestlers that fight on this plank, and the the loser goes in with the piranha. The other piranha attack I remember from movies is the toy with Richard Pryor. Why was that? I can't remember it. I think there's a moment where he tries to cross a waterway and there's piranhas and they eat away all his clothes, you know, and the, and that stars flick from a Christmas Carol. God, you can't get away from the schlock machine here. I apologize, dudes. You guys all lost some intelligence spending an afternoon with me. I'm sorry. You guys were God, smarter when the show started. Lining up a lot of films though. We're going to start. Marketing uh, on. You're the rain man of movies, baby. Uh, well, you know, it's, I don't know what it is. I, I, I don't have, I don't have any talent in any other category other than being a walking library, I guess. But if you want to see something bad, I'll find something to recommend you. <laughs> the wild Geek is what's making out of here. Watch that have you guys sure. seen Harold yeah. and Lillian? What's that? Harold and Lillian? No. no. I think you all, you would both love it. Uh, Lillian had uh, 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 the reference library uh, that everyone uh raved about that was moved around uh mm. and i think it's at zoetrope now and mm. her husband harold was a storyboard artist that fell into it oh and he's the guy it's a documentary that did the the graduate mm. that was a storyboard and he's like he's done 600 movies not credited on a lot of them because it was his storyboards that the directors used and never gave him credit. But they mm. did a documentary on him. Uh, uh, Daniel Ream. Uh, I did a storytelling event with him. Uh, but I think you guys would love it. Because uh, she talks about. Uh, uh, they were shooting I think Down by Law. Uh, and. Because her, her library. Be, like, people would just come to hang. Uh, so. But she sorry, said, finish, finish your thought. Waits, I'm sorry. Tom Waits was having lunch her every day she goes oh my god every story from tommy felt like a crime report yeah jesus yeah. unlike this show which is a crime report in some places <laughs> uh so um we're gonna cut you guys you guys have real work to do i mean so we're gonna cut you guys loose but we'll turn we'll let you guys have the last word in a second i'll start uh, the recommendation out of sundance this year for the best possible film project to see is a documentary on Devo w while another documentary about daughters and father daughter dances with fathers who are in prison is another one recommended so if there's two real recommendations we can make on the show today for people listening it's daughters and the documentary on Devo uh now I'll turn it we'll go around the room the ring of fame here we'll start with Ian you can last word goes to you you can make a recommendation you can uh, file a police report you can do whatever you need but we'll start with you um, I'll say, I'll say on the Jean-Claude Van Damme, just because it popped into my head, uh, JCVD is a good one for you to watch if you're yeah. a fan. Yeah, I agree. A guy who actually takes himself lightly very well, I think. He's kind of grown into that. Uh, Ratchford, you got something? Uh, I, I am going to defer because do you guys not have a premiere this month? We do. We do, we do actually. Well, that's. That's what you should have mentioned. Maybe you should have pumped that, Ash. Somebody, somebody should be taking it correctly. Hey, we're, we're, not, we're not good at self promotion. We're really not. Well, I could tell when you said you wanted me to cut all the things out of me talking about some of your. Pre but anyway, what is the premiere? Let's. What? Where can people find it and get involved? Uh, the poster's right behind him there. Yeah, it's right over yeah, so his right shoulder. Red right hand is coming out February twenty third. It will be in select theaters and on demand. Good. There's Good. an amazing three minutes in this movie that I know of. <laughs> and I would I would second that. It's it's more than three. <laughs> That's all we get. There's just an amazing well, I guess we have to find out. We have to go, go find see, out. 
Got to go see. With you know, Jeremy. Down here. Andy McDowell. Little, little Ratchford he, action. You've never seen them? Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, we should go see it just to show some support, man. We should just go buy a ticket. And we should actually document that we're there. I'm game. It's the 23rd. Yeah. 23rd. Oh, wait. It's going to play longer than that, though, right? It's not, not just a special engagement. I may have no, to do no. the 24th. You never know these days. It'll, yeah, be, it'll, it'll be longer than, than one day. For we're sure. hoping okay. at least a week, right, or two. <laughs> That's but, good. That's that good one? in today's world. Yeah, so let's I, – I think I can maybe do the 23rd, but definitely I can do the 24th. I got to get the info on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it from you guys, and we'll get it to Ethan. We'll show up with bells on. And let's not, go. You know what? In fact, let me uh, – I'll see if I can get the Mongols or some group to come with us so we can round out the theater with some real personalities. Not the little elf bells that you chopped off those little I just had I had a blast revisiting these films with you guys. I did too. Uh, it was really fun. So thank you for, for having us on. No, thank you. Why don't you guys line up a day if you're interested in coming back and I'll make sure we, we do it. All right, we're gonna do laser blast and robot jocks. Really? Let me make a note of that. <laughs> See, if you're going to do something that I can find on Rift Tracks, I'm usually good for it. Uh, Laser Blast and Robot Jocks. And then we should, like, yeah, I don't know, it's interesting to watch those because then you should do their corresponding updates, which is like Pacific Rim and this movie called Kin, which they're both uh, uncredited, but they take the same. Hmm. It's like they're, they're, they're taking the. It's like similar the, plots. Yeah, yeah, similar tributes. Well, God bless you guys for the recommendation. So anything else to add? Or are you guys good to go? I'm good. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Laser what and what? Laser blast and robot jocks. These if you guys can blessed. send if you guys can send me the trailer to your upcoming movie, I can cut it in the middle of this. All right. We'll send uh, it to you. Oh yeah, no, it's it, it yeah, we'll fire it over to you for sure. Uh, awesome. yeah, I'll drop it in. That'd be All fun. Right. Well, I know where I'll be later in February. I'll be seeing the new movie. But in the meantime, there's other films from these guys you can check out. All of them are worthwhile. Like we said, it's the reason Michael Mann isn't doing Heat 2 is the work of these gentlemen. Uh, also, I want to thank Jeremy Ratchford for getting involved again. He's proven he's more of a psychologist or hostage negotiator than he ever was an actor in terms of how he deals with me. Definitely a class act. Uh, for us coming up, uh, if you survived our event with Ron Perlman, Tom Arnold, and the cast of Black Phone doing a Christmas carol for the Children's Hospital, you'll be happy to know we're going to do Clue with some of the guys from the original Clue, also for the Children's Hospital. Details of that will be on our website, BrigadeRadio1.org. And also, big thanks to the cast of Sweeney Todd on Broadway, who offered up a meet and greet for charity on our behalf at our request. Very kind of them. That goes down tonight. Uh, cool deal. Um, and uh, oh, and for those getting involved with our Patreon, which you know benefits social services, it's a new thing for us. If you're getting involved, we're offering up some tickets to Oingo Boingo to kick things off. All of it's for a good cause, and all of it will continue to be for a good cause. We're in the fight against NMOSD, we're close to a cure, and with that comes a cure for cancer, according to the Mayo Clinic. And you can find information from that at the Guffy Jackson website, guffyjackson.org. That is our primary focus with our work for the Children's Hospital this year. So all the fun things we do, folks, as you know, whether it's Ron Perlman or other characters, has got a cause attached to it because that's actually the main thing. Entertainment is one thing. Saving lives is another. That's our business. I want to thank these guys here for actually giving us a show. Thanks I'll apologize. Us. I'll apologize now for everything uh, I said uh, regarding John Milius and all these other meaningless stories, and we'll cut that out to actually streamline this into something more sensible and interesting. Please do not. <laughs> Please do not. Uh, but for everyone here at Combat Radio, thank you. BrigadeRadio1.org, new site is out there, and all of the craziness is on it, and we'll even mount the trailer to the upcoming film so you can bounce over to the website and see it for a few weeks. Thanks, everybody, and we'll catch you again soon.